Hello, we are live. This is Sound Booth Theater Live. Thank you guys for coming to the show. I'm real excited to get started here. Um, uh, I'm quite quite far ahead pre-read as well, and uh, just, you know, absolutely loving Everybody Loves Large Chests, as always. Um, Julie, Julio Leal, thanks for coming. Tristan, good to see you again. I will uh, acknowledge the existence of anyone else who decides to drop in. Actually, let me uh, post on you on Twitter one more or real quick about the stream. Uh, number three of ELC ten. It has already begun. Four whole hours this time. And let me go get the YouTube link. Boom. Sorry, guys. Sorry to promote in the middle of the stream. I just want more people here. Hey, Kyra Strickland, good to see you. Chump, Chumpkules, thanks for thanks for coming in. Really appreciate you. Oh wow, my. Uh, I so I have this setup where um, my desk tilts down, and so the thing that's the my monitor mount um, will not stay completely in place. Like the the they very slowly, gradually pivot this way. <laughs> Excuse me. So, even like it doesn't matter how much I tighten these damn arms, they just move. Oh, Robin Tucker has been listening to the audio immersion tunnel. Hope you're enjoying it so far. There we go into focus. And okay, so what do you guys think? You want the uh, you want the Ableton thing out here so that you can see what's going on on my DAW. Kyra Strickland, are you related to the new middleweight UFC champion? Is that your cousin? The man who made the Philly shell work in MMA. No, that's a shame. All right, so we uh, are on to chapter one, part three. Um, I am putting in a full four hours today. Really looking forward to it. Um, don't I, 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 I did not forget Chrome yesterday. That's why I'm able to show my screen now. Um, so thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Um, so, uh, yeah, today we're starting on part three of chapter one. I think... Chapter one will be the end of the cold reads. I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember exactly where uh, where it stops. I do like to stop at about 30% for cold reads, which means it's entirely possible that today will be the last one. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy yourselves while you're here. I will let you know, I guess, at the end of the stream whether there's going to be another one. Chumpkules says, last time I was in, you just got rid of the sound booth and you were recording DCC Immersion and the live sounded like a Zoom call. Well, um, I might have been accidentally using the wrong mic in that stream, so. Um, but uh, yeah, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody that there's plenty of ELLC 
uh, material on our uh, platform exclusively. We have the spinoff of Everybody Loves Large Chests. Small chests are fine, too. That is uh, Fizzy's st branch off story um, narrated by Dory Sachs, who has replaced me as Fizzy. In, and in my opinion, it, that's an improvement. Uh, she does a better fizzy, in my opinion, than I ever did. And uh, it's available in both classic audiobook form and cinematic audio, which means you can get it with or without the sound effects and music. Um, so both are available on our platform. If you uh, check the description of this video, you'll find links all over the place for all sorts of stuff, including... Naven Ilyev's other story, The Stars Have Eyes, also in full cinematic audio. That one actually doesn't have a classic audiobook version, but uh, it is actually one of our more subtly produced cinematic audios. It is a romantic comedy. It is a complete 180 from Everybody Loves Large Chests, from the sociopathic, uh, disturbing violence um, to a very wholesome, beautiful, thoughtful story about a dude just looking for love. He just happens to find love in the tentacles of a interdimensional being from beyond the veil of reality. So um, it's uh, it's actually quite a, a sweet story. Uh, I loved producing it. I definitely cried at the end. So um, go g give that a shot. Both of those have their first episodes available for free to listen to. And that's with the full cast sound effects and music to see if you like the rest of the series. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? Of course, the Dungeon Crawler Carl Audio Immersion Tunnel is uh, available. The first episode, the second episode, will be releasing on October 31st. And every two weeks after that, we'll have another episode that is uh that is available for pre-order the entire season is available for pre-order so if you listen to the first episode and you absolutely know you're going to keep going with it then uh go ahead and do that pre-order so you don't even have to think about uh going to purchase the next one and you get a basically about a 25 percent discount on the entire series if you get it get it through pre-order so um one more little piece of promotion, Shadow Agency uh, by M.A. Carlson is now available for pre-order on Audible. And uh, that is our, basically, a, a red wall of lit RPG. It's a bunch of anthropomorphic uh, animals doing a, going through a, a lit RPG story. So um, if you're interested in that, Zach Johnson narrated, uh, Emma Kate Starling was the female backup, and uh, I myself played the villain, uh, something Oros, Papa Oros, yes. Um, I get to play a really conniving baboon character, so um, that that's actually one of my favorite characters from this entire year having played, so I hope you guys enjoy that. Plenty of new stuff that just came out from SBT on Audible. Just go check us out. You know, maybe click my name and uh, sort by date added, and you'll find all of our newest stuff. Dungeon in the Clouds, uh, Mimic and Me, um, Prophecy Approved Companion Book 2, uh, all available on Audible, all new stuff. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy that. So here's to Everybody Loves Large Chests, getting back into it. What's up, Gray? Thanks for coming. Zero point. Glad to have you here. I don't know how many goddamn donut snips have I've recorded in the last few years, but you know what would be fun is if we like made a highlight video, made a not a highlight video, but like a, a little collection of goddamn donuts from the the first six books. There's only one from book six, as far as I know. All right, let's on full screen here. And let's get started. <clears throat> Part three. Don't pull on the rein so hard, Kira spoke softly. You're here to give the horses direction, not break their necks. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. It doesn't matter. That's Annie's part. Kira spoke softly. You hear? Oh, uh, okay. Robin replied nervously. So, more like this? Yes, better. They were sitting at the front of a luxurious stagecoach pulled by four thoroughbred war horses along the... They were sitting at the front of a luxurious stagecoach pulled by four... They were sitting at the front of a luxurious stagecoach pulled by four thoroughbred war horses along the Imperial Highway. Fuck shit ass. They were sitting at the front of a luxurious stagecoach they were sitting at the front of a luxurious stagecoach pulled by four thoroughbred war horses along the Imperial Highway. It was a good opportunity to give the bulkiest Nephilim some driving lessons, since, between the smooth road and the well-trained steeds, she didn't have to do much. <clears throat> Excuse me. She couldn't help but feel nervous, since this was her first time handling a vehicle, but she was eager to learn... She couldn't... She couldn't help but feel nervous since this was her first time handling a vehicle, but she was eager to learn and loved working with animals. She couldn't help but feel nervous since this was her first time handling a vehicle, but she was eager to learn and loved working with animals. Kira even complimented her initiative since driving a carriage was an important skill to have in life. Admittedly, the redhead almost never did it. Admittedly, the redhead almost never did it herself, but she could still teach Robin to pass the time on this long trip to the north. She, Rowana, Fizzy, and the triplets left Aenor Keep earlier that morning, and the road to Azurevale was a lot longer than the ride from Ambershore. I think I can bring this down just a little bit. There we go. Hello. Azure Vale was a lot longer than the ride from Ambrish. The front of a luxurious state. He didn't have to do much. She couldn't help but feel nervous since this was her first time handling a vehicle. But she was eager to learn and love. Sorry, just I, I'm always you know, since getting this new space, I'm always like re-examining it and getting picky about it and getting paranoid. I don't know how I I don't exactly know how I feel about the new space's sound. Um, maybe it's just got a little too much room. It's possible. Um, I've done a little bit to change that, but might be able to do more. I don't know. I wonder if I can get like um, slightly different configuration here, but we'll see. Hey, Silent Striker, good to see you. All right, so, all right, so another thing I need to do here is add sound effects notes. So, ambience. Um, carriage ride. Daytime. Sound effects. Pull reins too hard. Horse uncomfortable. There we go. Thanks, Facebook user. Appreciate it. They weren't alone. They weren't alone. Teresa's actual offspring were on this carriage, so it was only natural the Inquisition sent along a considerable escort. Kira's vehicle was accompanied by two more carriages, one in front and another behind, and a contingent of forty mounted knights. While this armed force was intended for the Nephilim's protection, the Redhead argued that it merely made them a bigger target. If she got her way, she would have taken the quieter approach and had them travel in a much more pedestrian fashion. 
After all, only the most confident of bandit groups stalked the Imperial Highway, and those people would surely consider having a crack at whatever prize was so well guarded. Try that sentence again. I was not convinced. Let's see. Can I tilt it a little more? After, after all, only the most confident of bandit groups stalked the Imperial Highway and those people would surely consider having a crack at whatever prize was so well... After all, only the most confident of bandit groups stalked the Imperial Highway, and those people would surely consider having a crack at whatever prize was so well guarded. Conversely, they were far less likely to pounce on a humble group of travelers. Conversely, they were far less likely to pounce on a humble group of travelers. Yes, a single carriage without any escorts would be a much easier target, but wouldn't carry enough loot to make it worth the heat they'd catch from the authorities. Briefly put, discretion was the better part of valor, in Kira's expert opinion. Unfortunately, Aenor's keep... Unfortunately, Aenor Keep's steward and Sigmund's right-hand man would have none of it. This guy's name was Patterson, and he was an even bigger stick in the mud than his boss. He insisted that Teresa's offspring be under constant guard and outright refused to listen to Kira's perfectly reasonable suggestion. Not only that, but he treated the redhead with so much hostility that it made Boxy wonder whether these armed escorts were tasked with protecting the triplets from outside harm or from Kira. Patterson clearly had some misgivings about entrusting the precious children to a known hero killer, though if what Madeline said... Patter Patterson clearly had some misgivings about... Patterson clearly had some misgivings about entrusting the precious children to a known hero killer, though if what Madeline said about him was true, they'd be under lock and key for their entire lives if he had his way. For better or worse, the second-in-command had no choice in the matter. Teresa herself had, through her chosen hero, declared that the Hero of Chaos would take temporary custody of her daughters. So Patterson followed his orders, despite the fact that he and several of his fellow officers were opposed to the idea. The Redheads secretly agreed with them, though for entirely different reasons. From an objective... From an, ob from an objective... From an objective point of view, it made zero sense for Teresa to allow her miracle children to be in the custody of a mass-murdering monster. Unless, of course, one considered Herman's involvement in this matter, especially the way he strong-armed the shapeshifter into this position. It was certainly an unpleasant chore, but such tasks were the exception rather than the rule. Other than a select few occurrences, Marjorie let Boxy run wild and do whatever it pleased, it practically had free reign compared to the other heroes. They were almost always preoccupied with some unho They were almost They were almost always preoccupied with some holy mission or divine duty or whatever. Whereas most of the hero business Kira had to take care of was just the monster within making excuses. Plus when it actually had to go Plus when it actually had to do Plus, when it actually had to do the god of gambling's bidding, there was usually a tasty little treat for it at the end. This babysitting nonsense held no prize and was effectively mandatory. Hence, <clears throat> this this babysitting nonsense held this babysitting nonsense held no prize and was effectively mandatory. Hence, Boxy's reluctance and annoyance. At the very least, it wanted to handle things its way. Its job was to gently shake the spoiled brats up, and roughing it for a week or two on the road was a good start. They could not be coddled by inquisitors or deities forever, and if they were to become self-sufficient, they had to have a solid grasp of reality and needed to understand how fragile life truly was. 
The best way to do that was hands-on experience, maybe a grueling boot camp or two. Having to fight tooth and nail for their survival against malicious monsters and bloodthirsty bandits would surely expand their horizons. Unfortunately, none of that was going to happen with this ridiculously flashy convoy, so Boxy had to resort to educating them through less efficient, more indirect methods. Which was why Kira had insisted that they pass through a very specific settlement on their way to the northern border. Whoa! Is that... Whoa! Is that the place? Robin exclaimed when she noticed it on the horizon. Mm-hmm. The redhead nodded. All of it? It's huge! That's O'Shinus for you. A tribute to humanity's greatness and a monument to their arrogance. The Empire's royal capital was as grandiose and extravagant as one would expect from a sprawling metropolis with nearly a... The Empire's royal capital was as grandiose and extravagant as one would expect from a sprawling metropolis with nearly a million residents. Countless tall spires dominated the cityscape. The massive stone walls defending it were so white they practically glowed in the late afternoon sunlight. Two massive rivers flowed in from the Sawblade Mountains to the southwest and converged into one before continuing their way north and east towards the Oculus Sea. To the southwest and converged in west and converged cheated i just cheated did you guys see that it's pretty cool uh julio leal asks how long have you had your new setup um two months the thing is, I got my new setup, and then I barely did any narration until just now. So, this is, um... This is, like, the most I've done in a while. I just realized how sloppy my uh, cable game is over here. I wonder if it's a pain in the ass to move this stupid mic stand. Guys, this is just bothering me. I'm gonna fix it. I'm fixing it now. There we go. That's better. I still have my old setup. Someone asked if I broke it down. I mean, all the gear is taken out of the booth, but it's still there. What is boxy DPA? What do you mean? What does that mean? Oculus C. This gave the capital direct access to a sea trade route in addition to the land-based ones, allowing all manner of goods and people to flow through. 
Ah, excuse me. Though that was all far off on the horizon, the most Robin could see from her seat was a valley-sized mass of buildings. Her immediate surroundings were dominated by fields of golden grain and the odd farmhouse or ranch dotting the surrounding hills without a single soul in sight. At least at first. Excuse me. Traffic picked up significantly as the convoy got closer to the capital and more roads merged with the Imperial Highway. It wasn't long before travelers became a common sight, whether they were on foot, mounted, or in vehicles of their own. And every stranger they passed clued Robin in on a certain trend. And... And every stranger they passed clued Robin in on a certain trend. Uh, Kira? How come everyone is avoiding us so much? The townsfolk weren't simply a... The townsfolk weren't simply providing the procession a wide berth. No, People straight up pulled off to the sides of the highway and stood perfectly still until the Inquisition had well and truly gone by. Some oncoming traffic even made abrupt turns or did a complete 180 simply to avoid crossing paths. Robin could understand that behavior if it was on a smaller road, but this was the Empire's famous highway. There was plenty of room for travelers going the other way to pass by the sizable convoy and their escorts without any issue, so this extreme aversion struck her as odd. Because they're afraid. The cat girl bluntly stated. Of what? Is it my horn? Uncle warned people might give us a hard time because of that. Of what? Is it my horn? Uncle warned people might give us a hard... Uncle warned people might give us a hard time because of that. It's not you. It's the company you keep. She jerked her head at the mounted knights around them. The commoners would much rather waste a few minutes bowing their heads risk, rather than risking ruining their lives because they accidentally looked at a noble wrong. We're not nobles, though. Are we? Absolutely not. But we look like it. What about all the flags and stuff? That's clearly the... The commoners would rather than risking ruin. We're not nobles, though. Are we? Absolutely not. But we look like it. What about all the flags and stuff? That's clearly the... What about all the flags and stuff? That's clearly the Inquisition's insignia on the knights and wagons. It doesn't make a difference to a commoner. They see a fancy carriage flanked by soldiers, they make room for it. It's practically a reflex. Even if they do recognize the heraldry, Sigmund's way of doing things hasn't earned his people any favors. But Uncle's guys are the good guys. They got rid of all the evil nobles. Surely that's worth at least a thank you from these ingrates. Maybe that's how you see it, but good and evil are not absolutes. They are perspectives. Sure, eliminating the corrupt leadership may be good for the nation in the long term, but from a commoner's point of view, the Inquisition is nothing more than a bunch of bullies that took their lords away. Even if they did some bad things, those people have ruled over their lands for generations. They understood the territory's strengths and weaknesses as well as what their people would and would not tolerate. See that over there? Kira pointed towards a massive stone and wood windmill that had fallen into disrepair. That mill is a local landmark, a monument of sorts that was still in use a year ago. Even if it's ancient and not very efficient, it stood as a symbol that represents the simple and honest folk that tend to those fields. Yet, the freshly appointed lord of this area wants it torn down and replaced with a less archaic alternative. Uh, isn't... 
isn't that a good thing? I mean, if it works faster and makes their lives easier, who cares if it doesn't look the same? How would you feel if I took away all your clothes and replaced them with frilly dresses just because I thought they looked better on you? Robin put on a foul, wordless grimace that made it seem as if she was standing downwind from a flatulent troll. It would suck, wouldn't it? Kira flashed a toothy smirk. E yeah. Same thing, just on a larger scale. People hate changes forced on them by someone or something else. Even if it's for the best from an outsider's point of view, it may not necessarily be the same from theirs. That's why perspective is so important. This life lesson was something the other two Nephilim would have picked up on their own after a while, but Boxy felt the extra thick one had to have that point jammed down her throat. This life lesson was something the other two Nephilim would have picked up on their own after a while, but Boxy felt the extra thick one had to have that point jammed down her throat. Hmm. Robin strained her brain. Sorry, but I don't get what you mean. I agree that people like some things and hate others, but all this political and economic stuff just goes way over my head. I agree that... I agree that people like some things and hate others, but all this political and economic stuff just goes way over my head. My head. Something's going on outside. All right, it stopped. Way over my head. Nope. I... Sorry, but I don't get what you mean. Sorry, but I don't get what you mean. I agree that people like some things and hate others, but all this political and economic stuff just goes way over my head. All I want to do is punch bad guys, you know? <laughs> Sorry, but I don't get what you mean. There we go. That's fine, I suppose, Kira stated as she pulled her hood up. All I ask is that you make sure the ones you're hitting are bad by your definition, not someone else's. Boxy also suspected it didn't actually matter who she was inflicting. Boxy also suspected it didn't actually matter who she was inflicting violence upon, but Sigmund must have taught her to channel that aggression in a more positive direction. That I totally agree with. Robin nodded. Robin nodded. Been meaning to ask, by the way. Been meaning to ask, by the way. What's with the outfit? The cat girl was in full combat gear aside from her blades, which were stored in her magic belt instead of hanging from her hip. She also had a thick, dark green cloak that looked like a raincoat. It concealed her form so completely it was impossible to guess her figure while the low hood obscured both her racial and personal identity. <clears throat> it concealed It concealed her form so completely it was impossible to guess her figure while the low hood obscured both her racial and personal identity. It was a stark contrast compared to the Nephilim, who wore the same light clothes from the day prior. People hate change, Kira grumbled, and Alfred is its biggest fan. Who's Sally? Uh, who's Sally? Who do you think? Oh, right. So, what's that got to do with you dressing like a coat rack? <sighs> Kira sighed at the dense woman. Never mind. Let's just say it'll be better for everyone involved if nobody finds out my identity. Right. Gotcha. Hey, Lazy. Thank you. Love you, too. Un Unfortunately, that sentiment only lasted until they got to the front gates. Of the Imperial 
Inquisition, I hereby order you to make way for Kira Morgana, the hero of chaos and her retinue. By the Gates. By the authority of the Imperial Inquisition, I hereby order you to make way for Kira Morgana, the hero of chaos and her retinue. Ooh. The officer in charge of the armed escort was as subtle about the cat girl's presence as an exploding volcano. Retinue. The officer in there we go. Officially declaring that a person of interest was passing through a major settlement like this was one thing, but he didn't have to shout Kira's name and title at the top of his lungs. As if it wasn't bad enough that these armored clowns stuck out like a sore thumb, now the entire city guard would know she was here. As if it as if it wasn't bad enough that these armored clowns stuck out like a sore thumb, now the entire city guard would know she was here. The one time Boxy was trying to draw as little attention as possible to its public persona somehow turned into an improvised parade. Once his face had even sent word ahead that Kira would be arriving, forcing her into this guest of honor. What's his face had even sent word ahead that Kira would be arriving, forcing her into this guest of honor position. It was all a farce, of course. He probably thought the cat girl would have. He probably thought the cat girl would have to sit in at official meet and greets with various big shots and people of relative importance, allowing his people to keep an eye on her. Part of him probably felt the woman should have been thankful for the chance to rub shoulders with people of prominence. He was, he was, however, sorely mistaken, because Boxy had better things to do than play politics with its food. Whoa! Would you look at this place? Can you believe... Wait, what? Kira? Where'd you go? <clears throat> Where'd you go? Robin was so excited by all the fancy buildings and masses of people that it took her a Robin was so excited by all the fancy buildings and masses of people that it took her a while to notice the beastkin ranger was no longer next to her. She had disappeared so abruptly and quietly it was almost as if she was never there. Robin started to freak out as she had no idea what was going on. Neither did any of the inquisition troops who only realized the hero's absence once the Nephilim started making a fuss. Only when the group arrived at the mansion where they would be staying for the night did Rowana and Fizzy reassure the others that it was, in fact, their own fault that Kira disappeared. If the Hero of Chaos didn't want to do something, then no mortal lo if the If the Hero of Chaos didn't want to do something, then no mortal alive could make her do it. Nobody knew that better than her future spouse, who made sure to give Patterson an earful. Nobody knew that better than her future spouse, who
who made sure to give Patterson an earful for trying to force Kira into social obligations she clearly didn't agree to. Meanwhile, Boxy made its way to one of the nodes in its dungeon network some fifty kilometers away from the capital. It planned to do that from the start, so it had Snack go ahead while it was stuck on that carriage so that it could transfer... It planned to do... <clears throat> It planned to do that from the start, so it had Snack go ahead while it was stuck on that carriage so that it... It planned to do that from the start. Damn it. It planned to do that from the start, so it had Snack go ahead while it was stuck on that carriage so that it could transfamiliar there at the first opportunity. Now that it was finally able, it used ne <sighs> Now that it was now that it was finally able, it used Nexus access to transport itself across the ocean to the dungeon beneath the smelliest mountain in all of Velos. The Hilt Creeper had just arrived at Rancid Rock when it was tackled from behind by a mass of muscle, fur, and feathers that knocked the wind right out of it. After re-evaluating the situation, it realized that this was not an act of aggression, but an overenthusiastic hug from Jen. That explained why she had that miniature smile on her face and was rubbing her cheek against Boxy's. That, that explained why she had that miniature smile on her face and was rubbing her cheek against Boxy's. Her griffin side must have missed her parental unit quite a bit during the three weeks since they lost. Oh my god! Her, her griffin side must have finished her. Her griffin side must have missed her parental unit quite a bit during the three weeks since they last saw each other and was currently soothing her loneliness. It was nothing the shapeshifter couldn't endure. The clingy harpy returned to her usual self after about ten minutes of generous head patting. The way she managed to be so childish in one moment and yet mature and collected in the next was quite odd though also inconvenient. At the very least, she seemed to have been busy fulfilling her duties, as her dungeon home was decorated with a plethora of trophies from defeated foes. Plethora of trophies from defeated f at the At the very least, she seemed to have been busy fulfilling her duties, as her dungeon home was decorated with a plethora of trophies from defeated foes, mostly the bare skulls and battered helmets of monsters and men, Though one piece in particular caught Boxy's attention. All right, one sec. I need to do some sound effects notes. No. The officer in charge of the armed escort was as subtle about the cat girl's presence as an exploding volcano, officially declaring that a person of interest was passing up of his lungs. As if it wasn't bad enough that these armored clowns stuck out like a sore thumb, now the entire city. The one time Boxy What's-His-Face had even sent- It was all a fart. He probably thought the cat- Part of him probably felt the woman- sh He was, however, because Boxy had better things- Robin was so excited by all the fancy buildings and masses of people that- She had disappeared so abruptly, Robin started to freak out. Neither did any of the Inquisition troops, who only realized the hero's absence once the- only when the group arrived at the mansion where they would be staying for the night did Rowana and Fizzy reassure the others that it was, in fact, fact, their own fault that Kira disappeared. If the Hero of Chaos didn't want to do something, then no mortal or spouse, nobody knew that better than her future spouse. Nobody knew that better than her do it. Nobody knew that better to agree to. Meanwhile, Boxy made its way to one of the nodes in its dungeon network some fifty kilometers away from the capital. It planned to do that from the start, so it had Snack go ahead while it stuck on that away from the capital. It planned to do that from the start, so it had Snack go ahead while it was opportunity. Now that it was finally able, it used Nexus access to 
The hilt creeper had just arrived at Rancid Rock when it was tackled from behind by a mass of muscle, fur, and feathers that not... mountain in all of Velos. The Hilt Creeper had just arrived at Rancid Rock. The Hilt Creeper had just arrived at Rancid Rock when it was tackled from behind by a mass of muscle, fur, and feathers that knocked the wind right out of it. After reevaluating the situation, it realized that Velos. The Hilt Creeper had just arrived at Rancid Rock. Rancid Rock, when it Right out of it. Right out of it. Mm. After reevaluating the situation, it realized that this was not an act of a out of it. Nah. After reevaluating the situation, it realized that this was not an act of aggression, but an overenthusiastic hug from Jen. That during the three weeks since they last saw it was nothing to shape. The clingy harpy returned to her usual <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> The clinging heart. The clinging harpy returned to her usual self after about ten minutes of generous head padding. The way she man. Is that a griffin's beak? Is that a griffin's beak? Affirmative. <clears throat> the shapeshifter's shoulders drooped in exasperation. <sighs> Didn't I tell you to steer clear from the Inquisition? Clarification. I did not fight it. I merely finished it. Explain. It. Explain. I found the griffin on the mountain above, near the summit. It was heavily wounded and had crashed after trying to fly despite its injuries. It was so weak that if the poisons in the air didn't finish it, the harpies at the summit would have. I ended its suffering. I see. What did you do with the body? I collect... Collected the beak, talons, and a few feathers, then kicked it down the slope and into the jungle below. The carcass was gone without a trace after two days. Though she was never the best at subterfuge, Jen fully understood the importance of covering her tracks. This was where Velos's infamously voracious wildlife came in handy, even if a how even a house-sized griffin was completely swallowed up in no time at all, bones and all. Hmm. That's good enough, I suppose. What could have hurt it that badly, though? Even though griffins were not native to Velos, they were at least as strong as adult hydras, possibly stronger if one factored in their ability to fly. Not many things would have brought down something like that. Unknown. However, I did sense traces of blight infection. Hmm. Hmm. I guess the idiots are getting closer to that Alistair fellow. 
The heroes of the Hammer and Sun had remained on Velos for the express purpose of hunting down the rogue Blight Lord that had orchestrated the recent rampage. This development was hardly surprising, but Boxy expected it later rather than. This development was hardly surprising, but Boxy expected it later rather than sooner. Most likely, Now had been coerced to offer his assistance via the liar, even though the state. Most, most likely, Now had been coerced to offer his assistance via the liar, even though he stayed behind for other reasons. Regardless, the shapeshifter was not only glad to have missed local events, but was looking forward to remaining uninvolved. It hated fighting the undead, mostly because they all tasted horrible. You should be more careful, it warned Jen. If the Inquisition is making moves, they might come to investigate this place since the ambient toxins could be hiding the presence of blight. If the Inquisition is... If the Inquisition is making moves, they might come to investigate this place since the ambient toxins could be hiding the presence of blight. Is such a thing possible? Dunno. But if I can think of it, so can someone else. If anyone comes snooping around and stumbles into the dungeon, don't bother defending it. Just escape, stay out of sight, and wait for me near the Gauntlet Temple. Understood. Good. Now stand still for a second while I check your progress. Now, st now stand still for a second while I check your progress. Now stand still for a second while I check your progress. Sorry, just catching up on the chat here. <laughs> Caleb, I probably would not have passed out due to heat stroke, but I don't know, maybe. It was not fun. It is much nicer to have this... You know, all this extra space here. All right. Boxy called up the dungeon management screen and brought its surveillance net back online. It normally kept it turned off because it gave alerts. It normally kept it turned off because it gave alerts every time Jen walked in or out of the place, which were far too annoying to be worth the bother. However, the module in question had to be enabled in order for the invader analysis... However, however, the module in question had to be enabled... However, the module in question had to be enabled in order for the invader analysis function to become available. I don't know why that tripped me up. Though the information it provided was only at the level of a basic appraisal, it was enough to see Jen's job progress, and the newest recruit had plenty to show. The Harpy had broken through the limit on her warrior job by maxing out all of its skills, putting her at halfway past level 56. Her griffin and harpy jobs were both on the cusp of level 16. As expected, progress slow... As expected, progress slowed dramatically after the first few levels. Jen had still gained nearly 40 total job levels in totals. Let's get rid of one of those totals. Jen had, Jen had still gained nearly 40... Jen had still nearly gained 40 job levels in total since her transformation three weeks ago. Considering that time frame, and that she had well over 200 levels prior... There is only one way to describe her growth rate. Impressive, the monster remarked. I knew I was right to have high expectations of you. Keep this up, and you'll get your next rank up in no time. The harpy blushed lightly, and her feline ears twitched in embarrassment, both signs that she was still weak to compliments. However, try to rely more on your natural weapons. Your harpy and griffin jobs should get a bigger portion of the XP when you kill stuff with your claws and talons rather than your staff.
crank up in no time. However, try to rely more on your natural weapons. Your harpy and griffin jobs should get a bigger portion of the XP when you kill stuff with your claws and talons rather than your staff. Noted. Boxy was fairly certain it had given her this advice at the start, but it couldn't hurt to repeat it. That aside, something on this invader analysis result struck it as... odd. That aside... That aside, something on this invader analysis result struck it as... odd. Another thing. Why did you rename yourself? Because I wanted to. And I could. So I did. Uh, of course you did. God damn frugal grin. It grumbled something unintelligible. Damn frugal grin. It grumbled. It grumbled. It grumbled. Why is it still clicking? It grumbled. It grumbled. It grumbled. Why? It grumbled. It grumbled something. It grumbled something unintelligible. It grumbled. It. It's still there. God. Damn. God damn Virgil. It grumbled something unintelligible. You are displeased. Do you not approve of my new name? Not really, no. I get that it's a sign of fealty, but Boxy's little birdie is just wrong. On so many levels. On so many levels. Should I change it to Boxy's Big Bird, then? No! No! See, the little isn't the issue here. I mean... It kind of is, but just change it back to what it was before. Or you can just use Jen if you'd rather leave your former identity behind. Bird, then? No! See, the little isn't the issue. What's up, Bill Underbridge? Haven't seen you here before. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Hope you're having a good time. Identity behind. Behind, behind, where'd it go? Fizzy had something of a hang-up in that regard, so it was possible this harpy might have thought similarly. Then again, names and families were far more important to dwarves and gnomes than they were to other cultures, so perhaps this renaming was just a whim. In the end, it didn't matter at all. In the end, it didn't matter all that much what she called herself, should she get appraised, her ultimate skill and job composition would identify her as Jennifer Jackson, no matter what her name tag said. If that happened, and that was a big if, Boxy would rather not have its name on her status. Understood. I'll take care of it, Jen conceded. Oh, by the way, I left some gifts for you in the golden chest in my room. Boxy was standing over the shiny container mere moments. Boxy was standing over the shiny container mere moments after the word gifts left the harpy's lips. It eagerly flipped it open and was delighted to see a small pile of treasure and a few magic items, no doubt leftovers of the poor saps that fell victim to Jen's level grind. No doubt, no doubt leftovers of the poor saps that fell victim to Jen's level grind. No doubt. Like items, no doubt left.
There's a truck. It's a pissed off truck outside. It would appear she had also hit the It would appear she had also hit the jackpot, as one of these was an artifact which the Dungeon Core's item allocation module had no I It It would appear she had also hit the jackpot, as one of these was an artifact which the Dungeon Core's item allocation module had no difficulty identifying. Rotlisk's Autobiography an ancient tome that once belonged to Rotlisk of Clan Okoza, one of the founding members one of one of the founding members of the Sage Scale tribe of Velos. The memories and experiences of the Master Psionic had been imprinted into this book's illegible pages in ways mere ink could not convey. Just holding it grants one a just holding it grants one a deeper understanding of the mysteries of the mind and how to best harness its powers in the form of a telekinetic blast. The grimoire does not look like much, and whatever magic is holding it together is gradually deteriorating, making it a fragile relic that must be handled with care. Type, grimoire. Quality, artifact. Offensive ability, F. Defensive ability, F. Durability, D-. Magic amplification. 30% mind, 20% force, 5% all. Enchantments, master intelligence, greater wisdom, greater mental fortitude, innate ability. Estimated value, 21,500 GP. Well, does not look like much was an understatement. The book's dull brown cover was so worn it was impossible to tell whether it was actually as valuable as the report claimed. Then again, the item clearly had historical significance on top of its high-grade enchantments, so that estimate was probably accurate. At the very least, it was far more informative than the meaningless yet misleading priceless tag that most scribes put on these things. Still, it was rather impressive the thing survived an encounter with the Griffin Harpy, that was more than could be said of its previous owner. That was... That was more than could be said of its previous owner, given the relatively fresh blood stains on the book's spine. Regardless of its history, Boxy happily pocketed the item and the other miscellaneous shinies and gave Jen a blush-inducing... Good job! Sing, Good job! before returning to its home continent. Though the dungeon it was using as a relay was still charging its MP after having sent the creature across the ocean. Though, though the dungeon it was using as a relay was still charging its MP after having sent the creature across the ocean, it was a while longer before it could return to the Imperial capital's outskirts, whereupon it called out to check on how its familiar was doing. Oy. Excuse me. You're across the ocean. It was a while longer before...
Snack, you still there? The two had been more than a hundred kilometers apart for only half an hour, so it was a safe bet her conjured flesh hadn't yet destabilized. Oh, welcome back, Master, the djinn replied to its telepathic message. I trust the newest addition to your menagerie is doing okay? I trust the newest addition to your menagerie is doing okay? Zira believed it would be a terrible shame if that woman got herself killed after all that effort her master put into recruiting, remaking, and re-educating her. Better than expected! Better than expected! It ecstatically responded. It ecstatically responded. Her growth is exceptional. Her growth is exceptional, and she even got me a new artifact. Well, a crappy one, but still an artifact. That is wonderful news indeed, she gracefully said. Congratulations on your newest acquisition, Master. Thanks. Boxy now had a whopping 33 of these rare and powerful items in its collection, which amounted to roughly 10% of the artifacts currently in circulation around the world. It had employed a variety of methods to achieve such a tremendous result, including dungeon diving, treasure hunting, extortion, thievery, and straight-up murder. The last three were the most effective, and therefore most frequent, but also the most notable. The last... the last three... The last three were the most effective and therefore most frequent, but also the most noticeable. The shapeshifter unintentionally spawned rumors of a relic hunter roaming the continent, which only served to make future heists more difficult. That said, it wasn't as if the shapeshifter went after every single artifact it caught wind of. After all, while gearing up for the up... After all... After all, while gearing up for the upcoming Dragon Festival was important, it mostly sought out these priceless items to satisfy. After, after all, while gearing up for the upcoming Dragon Festival was important, it mostly sought out these priceless items to satisfy its own greed. There was no point in chasing after everything tagged an artifact, since some of them were duds. The one it got from Jen was a prime example, an objectively powerful item. Yet it wasn't shiny at all, and was practically useless to the monster. It would not have bothered with it at all if it hadn't practically fallen into its clutches, which was far from how artifact ac it would not it would not have bothered with it at all if it hadn't practically fallen into its clutches, which was far from how artifact acquisition usually went. The other relics in its possession had required significantly more time, effort, and resources to obtain. I am happy to report I have more good news for you, Master. I have been able to confirm some very tasty rumors while you were away. Oh? It would appear the demoness had not been idle while her owner was busy checking on the bird-brained brawler. She had previously picked up on a certain matter from another familiar through the Beyond's grapevine. She didn't mention it at first. Her... She didn't... She didn't mention it at first, since her fellow demons were hardly the most trustworthy of sources. If this news had turned out to be an exaggerated fabrication, all she would have accomplished was to annoy her master by getting its hopes up for nothing. Such an outcome was clearly not going to put it in the mood for the organ-crushing... Such, such an outcome was clearly not going to put it in the mood for the organ-crushing intercourse she lived for. She lived for. For. Damn it. Such an outcome was clearly not going to put it in the mood for the organ crushing intercourse she lived for. <sighs> Excuse me. There is a secret auction taking place three weeks from now, right here in the capital. They'll be selling all kinds of unique equipment, including several artifacts with an emphasis on buyer anonymity. It was therefore rather fortunate for her that this particular beyond-sourced information had held up to scrutiny. Snack. I am going to shove my tentacles so far down your ears they will meet in the middle. Because, like all good bosses, Boxy knew that exceptional results... Bo 
Boxy knew that exceptional results deserved special rewards. Boxy knew that... <laughs> Looking forward to the mindfuck, Master. Matt asks, this is a dumb question. Not a dumb question. This is a perfectly reasonable question. But why does Jeff put each voice as its own separate track? Is it just easier to edit that way, or is he editing the sound on each track? So, um, I can demonstrate a little bit. So, the, this purple track here, my thought track, is actually where I put um, stuff like, uh, for instance, in Dungeon Crawler Carl, you know, when the chat happens, um, and there's like a bit of this person, and then it's, uh, you know, whatever they say. There is a secret auction taking place three weeks from now, right here in the capital. So there's uh, there's like a built-in effects on that track for thoughts. Um, for other things like the chick track here, um, I have slightly different EQ settings for my female characters so that some of the, um, uh, uh, what is it called, sympathetic, um, sympathetic frequencies that happen within my chest cavity don't uh, don't come through. So, like, um, you know, obviously we males have bigger chests, so m we have more of that bass resonance, and so that that can get cut out by some EQ. Um, other things, like for instance, um, well, first of all, I just got a, a message from Neven saying he's he'd rather the triplets get a different voice actress instead of me. So um, I'm actually going to go through now that I've finished this chapter and kind of pull out all of the um, all of the character voices for the triplets, and I'm actually going to audition somebody for those parts um, here pretty soon. Um, I think I already know who I want to play them, but I need to check on accent stuff here. So let me ask Naven real quick. So, all right. So I just asked the um, I just asked the author. So one one thing that I had uh, kind of taken for granted, and I feel like I'm wrong about this now, um, after thinking about it a little bit more, is that the triplets. Um, I gave the triplets an American accent, and that's because Teresa has an American accent, and so does Cora. But then after thinking about it for for a while. Um, I don't think that either of those characters would have had much... Well, actually, I know that Korra doesn't have any um, any role in raising the children. Uh, and I imagine Teresa wouldn't either, because she's a goddess. And, you know, god, gods and goddesses are notorious absent, uh, absent parents. So uh, they, they are actually influenced a lot by Sigmund Law who is uh, the champion of Teresa, and he has like a northern English accent. So I might actually, it might be better, um, it might be better if they get that accent instead. So I just, uh, I just asked Neven if, if he's cool with me giving them a, a northern accent, then I would like to get Lucky by Fleet on these characters. Ah, uh, all American accents.
we'll wait for his uh, his input. For now, I'm going to go ahead and move these characters to a different track. Um, so yeah, uh, a different track. The reason I would put them in a different track for a different actor is so that all of that particular actor's voices are in one track. So it's very easy for them to pick up the pick up the um, the set and do like put their voices into it. Like they they'll they'll see all of their parts like laid out right in front of them, and so it's very easy for them to go in there and replace what I've done. Yay! You're here! Okay, so that what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate this track. I'm going to, let's see, that's her first line. Get rid of all this. And we'll call this one Lucky. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that he's going to say yes to the accent thing because Naven usually doesn't really give a fuck about that kind of stuff anyway. So uh, let's see. Lucky. What color should I give Lucky? This is this will only be my second time working with Lucky, who is, by the way, if you guys have not, uh, well, many of you have probably listened to Jackson and Lucky Byfleet is the actress who played the, uh, the she was in the interlude where she called into Demons Are Us to get a fiend. So she's actually she's actually like quite quite good, quite a good actress. So I'm looking forward to this, but I haven't I'm not used to giving her a color. How about this nice sea foam green type thing going on here? Hey the I don't know that No, I don't think I have anything in check one for this. <laughs> okay, so lucky. Nope, not sniggle, sniffle. Um, I don't know if how well you guys can see. Uh, yeah, that particular playback, it's because it's doubled up. That's why I soloed it. Do we have, actually... Yep, for some reason. We got the, uh... Oh, wow. Why is that utility on 10? That's insane. All right, I turned off everything in the master. Get off her! There we go. Much better, huh? <laughs> Caught off guard. Ward. God damn it. Copy that one. Give this note to Lucky as well. need for violence. Uh, 
I might even make like lucky lucky one, lucky two tracks so that it's easier for her to overlap voices because the three triplets are going to be talking, you know, over each other a lot. There's going to be a good reason for her to like switch tracks, kind of layer one over the other so that, you know, they will interrupt each other. What I was doing was just um, blending it here. You see this um, this uh, crossfade going on, but I'm not going to expect her to know how to do that. Okay, so anyway, pretty sure. Get off her, you creep! <laughs> Indeed, I am. Now, could I ask you to release Robin? Lee, no need for violence. <laughs> sure, there is! So yeah, let's duplicate this. Go ahead and get rid of these. And we'll get rid of these here. Violence. <laughs> I just need to use more of it. Just get off of me. Oh, <laughs> Indeed I am. Now. Sure there. Heavens, that was exciting. I've never been threatened like <laughs> Don't be silly. I... I see. So that's what it was. Right. Uh, my name is Lydia. I am an apprentice priest. I apologize. They've always been loose and up, sis. We're just having a bit of fun. Watch it, Madeline. You're invading... Whew, yeah, fat load of good that did me. I got thrown about like a sack of flour out there. Indeed. Uncle Sigmund, of course. Uh, never really thought about it. Is there something wrong with our names? Of course. Never really thought about it. Uh, let's get rid of the sibling. Muscular sibling. The muscular sibling shrugged. Why do you ask? Why do you ask? Lydia inquired. Is there... I'm afraid I don't follow. <laughs> you look cute when you do that. I don't know what you're talking about either, but I have been told I'm a bit thick. We are Nephilim, born from the... Damn it, I swear I had her name down. Focus, Lydia. <clears throat> of course, my apologies. Damn it, I swear I had her name down. Oh, no, that's right. Uh, nope, let's see. 
Yeah. <clears throat> of course, my apologies. But, and our great, great... Surprisingly, not much. We can see in the dark, but that's about it. We did get a bunch of blessings from some of Mom's friends, though. Madeline interjected. Nairis was how we managed to grow up so fast. Wait! Aren't you girls forgetting about that dreaming thing? Robin reminded the others. I'm pretty sure that counts as a special... Well, sometimes we get these lucid dreams. <sighs> it is uh, difficult to describe. Oh, no, not one to one. So it's probably more like five to one. Editing, mastering, proofing, retakes. It's, it's probably more like five to one as far as like how long it takes me to narrate. Um versus how much editing time there is. <laughs> it is... Uh... Although right now I'm taking extra long because I'm doing some of my own editing. Closer to Teresa. All right, so we need... Uh, it's not going to be lucky. We need somebody else. Because unfortunately, this is the only, this is the only time I've ever had this issue. Um, lucky is uh, from England, and she has a lot of great accents from England, and she's even got an awesome Icelandic accent, so... Any of you guys who are Dungeon Crawler Carl fans who have listened to the audio immersion tunnel and know what's coming up, um, you will know that there are some Icelandic characters that we need um, that we need voice to. You know, I think it would do, it would be great for them to have Icelandic accents, and so and she's really good at them. Um, so yeah, but she can't do Yank accents. So it's it's kind of funny. I've never I've not really encountered a lot of English people who can't do. Um, American accents. <laughs> it is uh, difficult to describe. Lydia took a... However, yeah, we even got to see Daddy a few times. Madeline declared joyfully. Can't wait to meet her in person. She said you could make that happen, so I've... Big, strong, three horns, kind of like... She's going to need more than that, you dolt. Lydia reprimanded her. Father is a female fiend with six arms. <gasps> yeah! Come. I want to be a knight and ba I want to smash their faces in to avenge all the pain they- I don't want to fight at all, to be honest. I want to be a bard and inspire people with my songs. Lots and lots of babies. At least 517. Oh, oh, not this why again. are you being Hundred seventeen. Oh, oh, not this why again. Are you being weird? The other two roll. Okay, at what point is she off the ground? Ah, uh, I'm sorry for losing my temper. Yeah. Stupefied beast. Don't give me. Don't give me that look. We are the first of our kind. It is our duty to procreate as much as. Oh. I read a study that said 520 was the minimum divine. I estimate. Frankly, Lydia, the guy raised us. Robin pointed out. He's been more of a dad to us than our actual dad. <laughs> then. He's been more of a dad to us than our actual dad. <laughs> then why did he have to order all of the men stationed here to never lay a hand on us? Lydia retorted. Dad, <laughs> then why? Spirits and kind hearts. You know, sis, you don't need some big burly man. You could always let me try to put a bun in that oven of yours. Madeline, we've been over this. You lack the, uh... So? We're like the products of a miracle. Who says a second one can't happen if we do it hard enough? <sighs> Nature does, you dimwit. Enough. <sighs> 
Nick. Fucking wrong. So wrong. I think this is all. <clears throat> the clinging harpy returned to her okay, usual self correct. after about 10 minutes. All right. So they have to be someone besides. <laughs> they have to be someone besides Lucky. Um, okay. Nope, wrong color. There we go. I don't know. I don't know who to cast. Can't be Annie. Um, Annie's too busy. She's got too many different voices in this series already. I'll have to figure it out. I'll move on, though. Rename 1.4. Maybe Lori, but I don't know. I don't think she's she sounds young enough. These are supposed to be like, you know, I mean, <laughs> two years old and then magically made older. So. I wasn't even feeling like my voices really cut it personally, you know, so. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll have to think about it. Part four. Rowana, Robin, and Lydia were gathered inside a well-furnished sitting room as the sun lazily set outside the tall windows. It was a cozy space decorated with colorful carpets, plush seats, flowery wallpapers, lovely paintings, and lively houseplants. Each of the girls were relaxing in their own way after a long day of travel. The elf was lounging on a couch with her legs curled up, enjoying a refreshing cup of herbal tea. The elf the elf was lounging on a couch with her legs curled up, enjoying a refreshing cup of herbal tea. The youngest and most muscular of the Nephilim sisters was halfway through the six hundred one-armed push-ups of her evening routine. Lydia was absorbed in a book called... Lydia was absorbed in a book entitled Elven Culture... I don't know why I wanted to say entitled there, that's not what it says. Lydia was absorbed in a... Lydia was absorbed in a book titled Elven Culture and Customs, From Dominion to Republic, while sitting on her sister's wide back to add some weight to her workout. Having her seat constantly bob up and down looked to be an odd and uncomfortable way to read, but the eldest of the triplets didn't seem bothered in the slightest. All right, let's redo some organization here. Um, I'm going to guess that this one is not going to be needed, so let's do Annie. Get rid of that for now. Let's do this one and this one. Oh, wait, maybe this one and this one, and then make Annie... I did that. Where's Annie 2? Here it is. Any more chicks? Yes. Get rid of this one. All right. What I'm doing there, um, when when my interface turns orange like that, what I'm doing is I'm switching out my hotkeys. 
It is still useful to isolate characters by track if I'm doing all the voices myself because if I don't like a particular voice that I do for a character or, you know, if I'm halfway through a book and I like, I'm like, you know what, this voice just isn't working. I don't like this. Then I can go all the way back and find all of their lines very easily. Re-record it all, which I have done a few times, so... Okay. Excuse me, Miss Slythe. She suddenly spoke up. She suddenly spoke up. Yes, Lydia. May I ask you a question? Of course. You and Miss Morgana appear to be wearing your engagement rings in the traditional elvish manner, suggesting you intend to get married in your hometown. But it says here that same-sex marriage is not legal in the Ishigar Republic. Robin momentarily paused when she heard the sweet elf lady may be a criminal, then resumed her workouts. Then resumed her workout once she realized this was about one of those boring civil laws. All right, let's go ahead. Ambience. We are in well-furnished sitting room as the sun lazily set outside the tall windows. Okay. Rowana, Robin, and Lydia were gathered inside a well-furnished sitting room as the sun lazily set outside the tall windows. It was a cozy space. workout once she realized this was about one of those he may be a criminal then resumed her civil laws. It isn't now, but it will be in four months, Rowana replied calmly. You know what our exarch is? The leader elected by your people through popular vote. Yes, I'm aware. The current exarch is a respectable gentleman by the name of Alizar. He's one of the many people whose lives Kira had saved, and he was so thankful he begged to repay her. She jokingly said something about wishing she could marry me, and the next thing we knew, Alizar passed a bill to make it so. We still have to wait until late autumn for it to come into effect, but neither of us are complaining. It was likely that her parents might have pulled some strings to expedite the process, 
but Rowana's wife-to-be was without a doubt the one chiefly responsible. I see. So Miss Morgana is fulfilling her hero duties splendidly, the Nephilim declared with a small smile. Huh? She is? It is the calling of the Hero of Chaos to elicit change for the betterment of all. Judging from what Lydia had read of the Republic's previous iteration, distancing themselves from the Dominion's oppressive ways was undoubtedly a step in the right direction. Ah, I see. I suppose that's one way to look at it, but that's not how she sees it. It isn't? Lydia raised an eyebrow. Kira is a kind girl, but she's quite selfish as well. She pushed for that law because she wanted the, the two of us to be as happy as possible, Ruana said, blushing lightly. The fact that others benefit from her actions is nothing more than a happy accident to her. Oh. Ruana. Ruana said. The fact that... What was I going to do? Damn it. I got distracted. Rich! Rich distracted me! What was I going to do? Then a happy accident to her. Blushing lightly. The fact that others benefit from her actions is nothing more than a happy accident to her. I don't remember, guys. What was I going to do? Shit. All right. I'm just going to keep going. So you're saying she did everything in her power to change a centuries-old law without even considering the political, social, or religious implications? The elf took a long, delightful sip of her tea, then let out a pleased sigh. delightful sip of her tea, then let out a pleased sigh. <sighs> she is delightful, isn't she? Indeed, she's quite incredible, isn't she? That's one way to put it? It was then and there, while sitting on top of Robin's bobbing back with beads of cold sweat forming on her forehead, that Lydia realized she was severely overestimating Kira Morgana's foresight. Or was she underestimating the lack thereof? Either way, she had misjudged the redhead. 
Either way, she had misjudged the redhead, and that realization showed her that the gods' chosen ones were just as flawed and willful as regular people. She was already aware of that, otherwise herself and her sisters would be carrying Sigmund's children right now, but she was grateful for the sobering reminder. The double doors that served as the only way in or out of the room flew open with a loud bang, startling the three women and drawing their attention to the intruder. The double door. The double door. Ah! The double doors that's That is what the tea is for. Intruder. Not believe this place. Madeline! Lydia yelled at her. I told you not to wander off and cause trouble. Bull. But this place is so freaking huge! Seems like, seems like, a waste of space. Indeed. Lydia nodded. Lydia nodded. I honestly don't see what the big deal is, Rowana shrugged. There's no flower garden, no hedge maze, not a single art gallery, and the staff is, frankly speaking, third-rate at best. It's an all-right enough place, but nothing to raise a fuss over. While the Inquisition's... While the Inquisition's... Over... While the Inquisition's embassy in the Imperial capital was undoubtedly a classy residence, it was no match for the opulent standards of the Slythe household. Over. While the Inquisition's embassy in the Imperial capital was undoubtedly a classy residence, it was no match for the opulent standards of the Slythe household. 
What is it with you guys? Madeline protested while stomping her foot. Get excited at least a little bit, will you? I think you're the one that needs to dial it down. You've been out of control since we left home, Lydia coldly reprimanded. Lydia coldly reprimanded her as she stood from Robin's back. First, it was the forests. Then, it was the fields. Next was the city and the people and a hundred other things. For Teresa's sake, you giggled for half an hour just because you saw, and I quote, a really big-ass squirrel. So I'm going to ask you again. Stop bothering our hosts. I'm with her, Maddie. Robin chimed in. You need to calm your tits before you know who comes back and does it for you. I'm with her, Maddie. Rob. back and does it for you. Oh, that's a good point, actually. While the middle sibling was used to being shouted at by Lydia and subsequently ignoring her, a single mention of she who must not be pissed off was enough to rein her in. Surprisingly enough, however, surprisingly enough, however, the one the sisters were so wary of was not a certain red-haired beastkin. The true identity of she who will wreck your shit was the woman who vaporized half a flock of doves with a single toss of her electrified wrench because they dared poop in her general vicinity. Let's try that one more time. The true, the true identity of she who will wreck your shit was the woman who vaporized half a flock of doves with a single toss of her electrified wrench because they dared poop in her general vicinity. All right, and let me change things up a little bit here. Let's bring this to this, and this to this, and delete this one, and bring Fizzy back. What are you meat bags going on about? What are you meat bags going on? Madeline squealed in surprise at the metallic voice that came from behind and below, practically leaping out of Fizzy's way as she did so. Hey, Fizzy. Hey, Fizzy. See. Rowana calmly greeted her. Don't mind them, they're just adjusting. Any word from Kira? Yeah, she just arrived a minute ago. She asked me to tell you, to, you lot to go see her in the kitchen. Said she had a gift she needed help with. Well, you heard her, girls. I'll meet you downstairs. Madeline carefully circled around the mithril dynamo golem, then practically ran off towards the staircase. The other two Nephilim followed in her footsteps, 
doing their best not to piss off the irritable golem while poorly hiding their intentions. Meatbags, the golem disapprovingly shook her head. Probably a wise decision, as Fizzy was already in a dour mood. One of their Inquisition escorts called her a foul abomination unworthy of being in the presence of the goddess's children. He also called her deity a worthless hack and a pathetic trickster, which didn't exactly ungrind her gears. She couldn't just turn the man's head into soup without causing an incident, so she had to grin and bear it for now. The paladin took some solace in the fact that Boxy promised to turn the insolent heathen into an anonymous stain on the ground, but that would have to... But that, but that would have to wait until their group was well and truly out of the Empire. Ground, but that on the ground, but that would have to wait and ground, but that. What about you, Fizzy? Care to join us? Rowana asked politely. No, nah, I'm good. I'll just be out in the yard doing my thing. Trying not to go charger mode on that loudmouth's ass. Trying not to go charger mode on that loudmouth's ass. She added internally. The elf nodded and proceeded through the doorway down the hall, and descended some steps before... That is a loud vehicle outside. Ow, 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 why? All right. Whatever it is, just chill outside. Mm. Sorry, guys. Just, just going to wait for that to shut the fuck up. Hopefully it doesn't take too long. Here, we'll see. That's not it. Um, shit. she have sent it through discord sorry guys i'm just uh looking for missing audio did she send it to my personal email
Sorry, guys. Be right back. Yep, okay. All right, crisis averted. And here goes back to Back to the recording. My bad, guys. And did some steps before... The elf nodded. The elf nodded and proceeded through the doorway, down the hall, and... The elf nodded and proceeded through the doorway, down the hall, and descended some steps before arriving in the manor's kitchen. The two chefs on duty and the three Nephilim were currently standing by the swinging door that led into the room, making it difficult for Rowana to see what they were staring at. After politely nudging her way through, she saw a massive horse beast splayed out in the middle of the checkered floor. It had glistening white fur, an arrow through each eye, three more in the neck, and a singing... God damn it. and a single spiral horn jutting out of its forehead. Three more in the neck, 
and a single spiral horn jutting out of its forehead. And standing knee-deep in its freshly eviscerated guts was none other than Kira. Oh, hey, honey, the redhead waved to Rowana, bloodied cleaver in hand. I caught us some dinner. Is that a unicorn? Madeline exclaimed. How could you? Huh? What are you talking about? Unicorns are supposed to be sacred. Uh, I, yes, I will be live reading on Discord. Uh, Julio Lil, after this cold read. Tomorrow, let's see, where are we at? Two hours in, so... And we're 24% into the book. So I'm pretty sure, yeah, this is definitely going to be the last cold read of the series. Or of this of this book. But I'll be narrating the rest of it in Discord. And it won't be recorded and I'll be doing much longer sessions. I'm hoping for like five hours a day for next week. Supposed to be sacred. Red. <laughs> the hero laughed merrily. Merrily. <laughs> Monsters being sacred. She's beating a dead horse. <laughs> she slapped the dead creature's hide repeatedly as she laughed, causing it to wriggle and gush bodily fluids. I think I'm going to be sick. The middle sibling covered her mouth with her hand and turned away from the gruesome sight. But that didn't seem to dissuade Kira as she merrily resumed dismantling her catch. Chop! I think I'm going to be sick. Chop. Catch. <laughs> Chop! <laughs> I needed that. Her laughter died down, and she carried on with a more serious tone. <clears throat> For real? Don't listen to those old fairy tales. 
Yes, unicorns are beautiful magical beasts that have a soft spot for virgins. However, that's only because they're perverts. Perverts. I needed that. Don't listen to those old fairy tales. Chop! Yes, unicorns are beautiful magical beasts that have a soft spot for virgins. Slurp. However, that's only because they're perverts. Slap. You can beat a dead horse by the water, but you can't make it drink. Maddie was doing her best to not look at the gruesome sight. Maddie was doing her best to not look at the gruesome sight, but she still saw the shadow of Kira's cleaver every time it rose into the air. She closed her eyes and plugged her ears, but couldn't block out those horrible noises and words, no matter how hard she tried. Damn it, why are people still talking to me? I just quit. I just quit the fucking program. Fuck them. Unicorns, bicorns, and tricorns, they're all monsters that only look out for themselves. Thunk! Don't let their herbivore nature f fool you. They are as violent and territorial as any troll or goblin. Snap! The ones you see prancing around the capital, monster tamer mounts, impossible to domesticate otherwise. Chop! They still have their uses, though. Their meats, pelts, horns, and blood are all valuable materials, but hardly worth the trouble. Fuck! The world would honestly be a better place without them. Stop it already! The blonde girl shrieked. You've made your point! No, I clearly haven't. Crack! Look, I know why you're upset. You felt your head ornament might have made you kindred spirits or something. Madeline's... Madeline's eyes flew open in surprise. How did Kira know about that when she hadn't even told her sisters about it? Fuck! And you wouldn't be entirely wrong. I've heard many people say unicorns and their ilk have some demonic influence in their heritage. Squish! Another thing you have in common with them. Another thing you lot have in common with them, I suppose. Hack! A few crimson droplets landed on the back of the... A few crimson droplets landed on the back of the blonde girl's neck, but the hero's lecture had captivated her so completely that she didn't even notice. But that's where it ends. Squelch! At the end of the day, they are just monsters, and you would be an idiot to ever approach one without the intent to kill. Plop! Don't get me wrong. Having dreams is fine. Great even. Chop! But you need to learn to watch your step before you gawk at the clouds. Shunk! Otherwise, you're the one that's going to end up on someone's chopping board. Fuck! Now, I'm going to need some help turning this thing into steaks and sausages. Those of you not willing to lend a hand are free to leave. The two human chefs looked at one another as they silently confirmed their intentions, rolled up their sleeves, and got busy. Rowana merely excused herself while requesting Kira save the horn for her, then left the kitchen as if seeing her wife-to-be gut a beast five times her size was normal. The triplets followed the elf, but their moods were far less casual about the demonstration. That was... enlightening, Lydia mumbled. I'd read that unicorns could be found in the capital's vicinity, but seeing one up close, it's nothing like the diagrams. They were relatively rare and difficult to catch, as they actively avoided people unless cornered. 
The only time any would willingly show themselves in front of someone was if they... <clears throat> the only time any would... F the only time any would willingly show themselves in front of someone was if they were alone and the person matched their special tastes. Unicorns chased after virgins, bicorns preferred used goods, and tricorns had a fascination with deviants past their prime. What happened to individuals charmed, coerced, or otherwise stupid enough to ride off into the forests atop their backs was best left unsaid. They were also considered something of a delicacy, which was why only one of the two that Boxy caught made it back to the kitchen. Enlightening my ass, Madeline protested. What was the point of showing us all that? I think I get it now, Robin declared, her hands behind her head as she stared blankly at the ceiling. It's all a matter of perspective, huh? What are you talking about? Lydia inquired. Well, where Maddie saw some sort of friend or pet, all I could think about was dinner. Robin was fully aware that different people had different opinions. However, having lived her short life in an echo chamber, she failed to realize how radically different these viewpoints could be. That barbaric and gruesome scene helped something finally click in her head. The conversation about the Republic's changing laws was also part of it. If the government could declare today's criminal as tomorrow's innocent or vice versa, then it made sense why her uncle had a hard time administering the goddess's justice. I'm just saying, I get what Kira was telling me earlier this afternoon. I need to consider other people's circumstances before I put labels on them. Which was going to be difficult considering she was not a people person. Oh, she managed to get something like that through your thick skull, did she? Lydia noted with... Lydia noted with a hint of awe. I think I'm starting to understand why Mother entrusted us to her. With the power of hindsight, she realized that disgusting dis... With the power of hindsight, she realized that disgusting display was intended to shock them out of their comfort zone and show them just how ignorant and childish their ideals were. With the power of hindsight, she realized that disgusting display was intended to shock them out of their comfort zone and show them just how ignorant and s With the power of hindsight, she realized that disgusting display was intended to shock them out of their comfort zone and show them just how ignorant and childish their ideals were. Robin needed to grasp that the world was not black and white, but shades of gray. Madeline had to face the uncomfortable truth that reality was not all smiles, sunshine, and rainbows. Last but not least, Lydia had to understand that theory and practice were the s last, last but not least, Lydia had to understand that theory and practice were the same in theory, Last but not least, Lydia had to understand that theory and practice were the same in theory, but not in practice. Or so the eldest Nephilim assumed, based on what she considered her own shortcomings. As the most well-read and intellectual of the triplets, she was distinctly aware that her lack of real-world experience was a major issue. She had tried to keep an open mind about things, yet events and situations constantly caught her off guard ever since the Nephilim left the safety of their gilded cage. For instance, what had happened upon their arrival at the capital mere hours ago. Dietrich Smith, the Lord Mayor of Oshinus, was supposed to do a meet-and-greet with the Hero of Chaos and her group since their arrival was publicly announced. It was mostly a polite formality, nothing to get too excited over, 
However, when the group arrived at Smith's residence without the guest of honor, the man practically chased Rowana, Fizzy, and the triplets out of his reception hall. He seemed extremely displeased and thoroughly insulted, though Madeline was convinced that was just an act. Lydia naturally assumed this was more of the middle sibling's relentless optimism, but something arrived for them at the embassy an hour later. It was a lovely fruit basket with a thank you note addressed to Kira, signed by none other than D.S. The revelation greatly surprised the left-horned triplet. Not just the Lord Mayor's roundabout behavior, but also the fact that Madeline had guessed his true intentions. No, stop! Not just the... Not just... Where did it go? Not just the Lord Mayor's round... Not just the Lord Mayor's roundabout... Not just the Lord Mayor's roundabout behavior, but also the fact that Madeline had guessed his true intentions, while she might not have had her sister's... While she might not have had her sister's brains or bronze, she had a gift for empathizing with people and reading between the lines. The Bard's tutoring helped nurture and develop it to the point even a seasoned politician was like an open book to her. It was also why she was able to easily brush off the fact that Kira threatened her with such intensity upon their first meeting. Though the hero put on a good show, the Nephilim grasped she wasn't serious about hurting her once the initial shock had worn off. There was a downside to her emotional sensitivity, namely the fact that she was the most childish and bratty of the triplets when things were not going her way. She continued to pout, grumble, and complain about Kira's impromptu lecture on realistic expectations, even if part of her recognized it was for her own good, having an innocent dream vandalized in such a brutal and insensitive manner would obviously leave her fuming. Her bad mood continued on for about an hour until the unicorn stew was served. Madeline naturally wanted none of it. Madeline naturally wanted none of it, but Robin convinced her to try, but... Mad Madeline naturally wanted none of it, but Robin convinced her to try it by putting the bratty girl in a headlock and shoving a spoonful down her throat. Long story short, unicorns remained Maddie's favorite animal, though she now preferred them served with forest spices, sweet corn, and dwarven burrow beans. Actually, let me check something here. I wanted to see what they were staring at. After politely nudging her way through, she saw a massive, hated guts was none other. And ambience. burrow beans. The all-female group resumed the all-female group resumed their journey northward first thing in the morning. The leader of the inquisitorial escort had a few choice words for the hero of chaos for disappearing like she did, but she shut him up almost but she but she shut him up by almost literally bludgeoning him with Sigmund Law's seal of authority. The next several days were mostly uneventful apart from Kira doing her best to educate the Nephilim siblings. The next the next several days were mostly uneventful apart from Kira doing her best to educate the Nephilim siblings on the finer points of the Empire's wildlife. Rowana also got in Rowana also got in on the tutoring by teaching them some basic tips for identifying magical herbs as well as a few basic remedies for common aches and pains. In fact, the triplets were more interested in the elf's lessons than the cat girls, though that was mostly because apothecary activity involved far more flowers and far fewer monster guts. It was also during this time that Madeline developed something of a gluttonous side. The sisters' diet had been strictly controlled during the the, sis the sister's diet. 
The sisters' diet had been strictly controlled during the two years they were growing up, and she was eager to experience these strange new flavors. She even went as far as badgering the soon-to-be newlyweds for cooking lessons, despite the fact that she had been told time and again she had to wait until they got to Azure Vale. Her seeing monsters as food rather than potential friends was a favorable development, but Boxy couldn't help but feel a bit worried about it. When it considered the fact that Lydia took after Teresa and Robin took after arms, having the middle sibling unironically ask whether goblins were tasty had some troubling implications. The group's time in the Empire drew to a close when they arrived at the nation's northern border on the sixth day. The group's time in the Empire drew to a close when they arrived at the nation's northern border on the sixth day after leaving Aenor Keep. Order on the sixth day Damn it. The group's time in the Empire drew to a close when they arrived at the nation's northern border on the sixth day after leaving Aenor Keep. The proverbial line in the sand between the Empire and the Republic was punctuated by a large military outpost where the Imperial Highway abruptly ended. The outskirts of the ancient forest called the Rainy Woodlands was visible on the horizon to the north. Within lied Kira's next destination, the city of New Whitehall. Though still recovering from the damage it sustained during the Calamity Conflict, the settlement had a functioning forest gate that would take the group straight to the elven capital. However, it would seem that getting across the border would be easier said than done, as three platoons of soldiers bearing the insignia of the Republic's legions blocked the convoy's path. Their presence was a bit worrying. It was ludicrous to think these men and women were here solely because of the turbulent political climate. While undoubtedly part of it, the g <clears throat> while undoubtedly part of it, the border between the two nations was so wide that keeping watch on this single spot was pointless. Unless, of course, they were waiting for a very specific someone. A ginger-haired elf wearing a green military uniform and a pair of rectangular, frameless spectacles approached the befuddled armed escort on foot, though he stopped at a shouting distance of about thirty paces. Oh, come on now. What happened to this one? Do we not have a dude too anymore? We do. Hail! Which of you gents is Inquisitor Patterson? Paces. Hail! He offered while raising his hands in greeting. Which of you gents is Inquisitor Patterson? That would be me, a mounted knight declared. A mounted knight declared. Identify yourselves. I am Agent Nim Gibbs of the Ishigar Republic's Foreign Intelligence Bureau. The men behind me hail from the Third Legion and are currently under my command. I hereby officially request a peaceful discourse with Inquisitor Patterson. Yourselves. I am Agent Nick. The men behind me hail. He held out his badge. The men. Intelligence Bureau. He held out his badge. 
The men behind me hail from the Third Legion and are currently under my command. Agreed. Agreed. That would be me. Identify yourself. Agreed. Having confirmed the other side's representative, the two men approached each other while their respective subordinates formed ranks. It was unlikely a skirmish would suddenly break out, but it was important to be prepared, just in case. Huh. So, the steward said with a huff, am I to assume you will not let us pass? Indeed, Gibbs adjusted his glasses. We simply... We simply cannot have a foreign military force roam around unchecked throughout our lands. I'm sure you understand? Of course he did. This was the standard way other nations treated the Inquisition. And nobody could blame them. Though religious at its core and not directly affiliated with the Empire's government, it was impossible to deny they were a potential threat. Plus, even if those in power understood the group's goals were noble, it was hard to convince the citizens of such. Plus, plus, even if those in power understood the group's goals were noble, it was hard to convince the citizens of such. Much like Kira had told Robin a week before, if a commoner saw a group of soldiers armed literally to the teeth approaching their home, they would automatically assume the worst. I'm afraid I must insist, the human stood his ground. We have in our protection people of interest that... I don't know, I kind of want to... I don't know if I really... I usually don't do uh, RP accent for the humans in this universe, but... Maybe, uh... Did I say bronze? I don't know where that is, so I'm... I'll just wait to proof it for proofing to catch it. Trist, that... That. Yes, I'm fully aware of exactly who and what you are transporting. I would not be here if I wasn't. Patterson looked over his shoulder at the carriage the Nephilim were riding. I guess they're on... Okay. Patterson looked over his shoulder at the carriage the Nephilim were riding and saw Kira leaning out of the window. Window, waving playfully at him with a smug, shit-eating grin. It was evident she had sent word of their arrival ahead of time and requested that the FIB replace the Inquisition as her escort. Window, waving, window, waving playfully at him with a smug, shit eat window, waving pl It was evident... It was evident she had sent word of their arrival ahead of time and requested that the FIB replace the Inquisition as her escort. It was hardly surprising, given how she was not exactly courteous with the human soldiers. She even went as far as calling them vaguely unpleasant names like obstacles or wardens. Her profound resentment of Imperial soldiers was well documented, as were her strong ties to the FIB, so this outcome was almost inevitable in hindsight. I'm afraid I cannot leave those children's side under any circumstances. Patterson declared, I must ensure their safety, regardless of where their guardian takes them. I understand you have orders to fulfill, however I dare say there is more to this. I understand you have orders to fulfill, however I dare say there is more to this than jurisdiction. Gibbs nodded at the something behind the... Gibbs nodded at something behind the human, prompting him to look over his shoulder once more. He was beamed in the face with the very seal of authority that Kira had been lording over him this entire time. Um... Shit. Is this the same guy that he called... that uh, Kira was calling, um... She gave him some kind of hat name. Oh, oh, Tin Face. Uh, 
There should be a VFX marker that I can use to find him. Let's see. Would he be in a different dude track? Maybe it's over here. No, this is 1.3. We're easy. Eat. Ladies be needing anything else? Who goes there? Yeah, that sounds like the same voice. Of too. course, we've been expecting it. Indeed. The man in charge called out to them. Kara Morgana, Hero of Chaos. I'm here on behalf of your boss. Claire. Of course. We've been expecting you. You have? Indeed. Our residence cardinal received an oracle from Lady Teresa saying you would be a... Ah. I see. The cat girl nodded. What happens now, then? Now I must ask you to follow me inside, madam. You lot... Help these fine ladies with their luggage. They are honored guests of the Inquisition, so I won't tolerate any slack or lip. The soldiers respectfully escorted their visitors to the gatehouse and, after a customary appraisal check, Understood. Our visitor's hall is right this way. Hero business, honey. Nothing to worry about. You there, Tin Face. Do me a favor and get my friends someplace where they can rest, would you? It was a long trip. The officer in charge of the welcoming party obviously disliked being called tin face, but couldn't dispute the bucket-like aspects of his headgear. More importantly, anyone who bore the Grand Inquisitor seal was automatically his superior officer. It was a symbol of authority far above his station, so he was duty-bound to consider those words an order from the hero of the hammer himself. Plus, he was one of the few people who knew what Maddie and her sisters truly were, so he understood what... Um, I'm just gonna ask Naven, because it's gonna take forever to find his name, apparently. If it even says. We'll see. I'm going to keep it how it is for now. Hey, there is more to this than air time. Air time. The large, coin-like object bounced off his helmet's visor, prompting him to try and... The large, coin-like object bounced off his helmet's visor, prompting him to try and catch it in a panic that nearly made him fall off his high horse in the process. After securing the precious object, he was made aware of the six women calmly walking past him with their luggage in tow. In this entire time him to look over his shoulder once more. He was beamed in the face with the very seal of authority that Kira had been lording over him this entire time. Higher time. The large coin...
In mind your language, madam, a passing sailor called out to her. When you insult this fine vessel, you insult both her crew and the workers that put her together. Kira glared daggers at the nosy mariner, giving him a nun. You ladies be needing anything else? Their luggage in tow. <clears throat> Keep the change, asshat, the cat girl sneered. You best hope we never meet again, the golem growled. Sorry about those two, and thank you for looking after us, the elf smiled. Later, Pats. Crack a few heretic skulls for me. Robin waved goodbye at him. We'll bring you some yummy yummy souvenirs when we get back, okay? Madeline promised. Oops. <laughs> Madeline promised. Do not worry, I am certain we are in capable hands, Lydia reassured him. I'll try to write every week. Patterson began swearing like a sailor in his head. He was in an untenable position. Teresa had decreased... Teresa had decreed... Teresa had decreed that the triplets follow and learn from Kira, and the girls seemed more than happy to accompany her. It wasn't as if he could just force them to stay behind, especially given the Legion presence that would surely interfere should he actually resort. Especially given... Especially... where to go? Where to go? Especially given the Legion presence that would surely interfere should he actually resort to force. Frankly speaking, the only reason he didn't quietly hand the children over was because of his own ego and slightly inflated sense of self-worth. It wasn't as if Patterson was a bad man at heart, but the responsibility of this task weighed down on him, clouding his judgment. Stand down, men, he ordered his subordinates. We'll take up residence in the nearest village and send word back to the keep. The Inquisition escort backed off, allowing the others to meet their new security detail in peace. So, these are your Legionnaire buddies, huh? Robin asked as she looked over the el Robin asked as she looked over the elven soldiers. Robin asked as she looked over the elven soldiers. Robin asked as she looked over the elven soldiers. Damn it. Robin asked as she looked over the elven soldiers. They definitely have a different feel to them than un Uncle Sigmund's guys. That they do. Nira not Nira. Kira nodded in agreement. However, I don't think buddies is the right word. That's rather harsh coming from you, Decanus. Gibbs smiled. The squad that served under you at New Whitehall... The squad that served under you at New Whitehall still The squad that served under you at New Whitehall still hold you in the highest regard. The squad that served under you at New Whitehall still hold you in the highest regard. He nodded at the line of troops, and sure enough, a few familiar faces saluted resolutely, though they didn't seem all that happy. In fact, none of them did.
Yes, well, you'll forgive me if I don't look back on war with much fondness. Same goes for you, Gibsy. The guy had become something of an unofficial liaison between the... The guy had become something of an unofficial liaison between the FIB and the Hero of Chaos ever since they met in the aftermath of the Gilded Hand's attack on Azure Vale. They were friends on a personal level, but their professional relationship was somewhat strained since they only ever met when shit hit it. They were friends on... They were friends on a personal level, but their professional relationship was somewhat strained since they only ever met when shit had hit the fan. It would appear this time was no different. Seriously, what's going on? The redhead sounded worried. I know I asked for an armed escort, but why bring the Legion? Also, why does everyone look so miserable and on edge? Gibbs took a cursory glance at his dispirited subordinates. While they tried their best to hide their collective unease from the foreigners, it was impossible to fool someone as attentive and perceptive as Kira. She just hoped she wouldn't notice. He just hoped she wouldn't notice until they got to a more secure and private location, as he knew firsthand just how stubborn the Beastkin Ranger could be whenever her curiosity was piqued. Both her tone and cross-armed stance made it clear she refused to go anywhere until she got a straight answer. So the agent gave it to her. I'm afraid something terrible happened while you were away, ma'am. He spoke in a heavy tone. Eleven days ago, Azure Vale was attacked by an unknown entity, leaving an entire neighborhood in ruins. Thousands lay dead, many more are homeless, in part of our forest Many more are homeless, and part of our forest gate network is crippled. It is the worst disaster in the city's history since the fall of the Elven Dominion. Possibly beyond. Rowana covered her gaping mouth in disbelief. Rowana covered her gaping mouth in disbelief as she tried to process the grim news, while Kira blankly blinked at the officer. Having overheard... Thousands lay dead. The triplets were also quite aghast at this sudden turn of events. Even Fizzy was visibly worried, but mostly about her workshop's integrity. Even Fizzy was visibly worried, but mostly about her workshop's integrity rather than the loss of life. The nearby soldiers' stoic masks crumbled as they shook with anxious rage or desperately tried to hold back tears. There is one other thing I should mention, Gibbs added, looking straight at Rowana. No. Dominion. Possibly beyond. Possibly beyond. <gasps> Rowana covered her gaping mouth in disbelief as she tried to pro. There is one other thing I should mention. She mumbled as the grim realization dawned on her. No! I'm sorry, Miss Slythe. Slythe. No! Please, Goddess, no! Your mother survived. But your father was not as fortunate. Your mother survived, but your father was not as fortunate. The platinum blonde elf broke out into a sorrowful wail and buried her face in Kira's shoulder. The redhead did her best to console the weeping woman while putting on a brave face, but the monster inside was practically fuming. Not because of the casualties, it wouldn't give a damn if every elf on the planet suddenly dropped dead. It was equally unconcerned about its lair, as Lavender would have reported any irregularities should its home dungeon come under threat. However, it considered the city of Azure Vale its... However, it considered its city of... 
However, it considered the city of Azurevale its playground, a front yard of sorts, which meant that, knowingly or not, this unknown entity had just taken a massive dump on Boxy T. Morningwood's lawn. And they were about to find out why doing that was an incredibly idiotic, extremely ill-advised, and phenomenally and phenomenally suicidal decision. Okay, so that is the end of that chapter. I got another one more hour of narrating to go. I'm glad I'm not done yet. Because I'm having so much fun. But I need to look something up. Um, do you guys remember Gibbs from Jackson? From, books, from book eight or nine? From book nine. Um, he would have been there, I think, right after the, uh, uh, excuse me, right after the attack in Azure Vale where they had, like, a blimp. They had a blimp and they, like, parach parachuted in onto that party. Let's see if I can find him. He's not in, nope, he's not in book nine. What about book eight? Where is book eight? Goroth is seven. Stain, here we go. Okay, so that's a very long chapter. What is it again? Or part of a chapter. Part two of chapter four. Ah, it doesn't fucking say in the script.
This is infuriating. Though I imagine mainly my fault, because... I don't see it anywhere in here. Wait a minute, there's another voices? to find out. This is chapter which? Chapter four, part two. His powers of deduction. Probably. Whatever his intentions, Boxy had no interest in playing his games right now. Nope. No idea what you mean. Kira shook her head. Sounds kind of like a library. World? The cat girl added. It wouldn't be worth it even if there were. The only soul I own is mine, and I plan to keep it that way. Even if there was someone capable of spending another's existence, I fail to see how such a despicable person would ever be chosen as a hero of magic. Now had a very good point. Voxy and its patron excluded, the deities of this world were inherently good and righteous beings, as were those they appointed as heroes. Sacrificing billions was an atrocity that none of the aforementioned parties involved would ever endorse. Even if a mortal were to grow depraved or insane, if I were to ask for something like the current time or where I put my keys, I'd only be asked to pay a few gold pieces. Realistically, whenever it's not worth it. Liar, forget I asked about the Sandman. Acknowledged. Canceling. Query. At the very least, it would appear now was unwilling to sacrifice the majority. I've worked with the guy, and the only thing he truly cares for is money. Don't get me wrong, he's a professional and a reliable ally. But only if you pay him beforehand. Point is, he's not the type of person that would help others if he wasn't getting anything out of it. That just makes me nervous. It makes it sound like he was also after the liar. Both the Gilded Hand and your friend from the FIB seemed to know about it, so it's definitely possible. <laughs> I see you're as sharp as they say, Mum. Gibbs chuckled. Yeah, that's supposed to be Gary. Part of the job, Gibbsy. That's what I fucking thought. You can't fool me, Gary. I knew it was you. Is this my first time using Dude 2? <laughs> the mangled door made a... Let's just bring this up to efforts. And we'll just rename this track to Gary. All right, so I think I can get through one more part today, um, which will bring us over the 30% mark. So I hope you guys are happy. You're making me go further than I usually go. You're making me do it, guys. I'm so pissed. I'm so mad at all of you. I'm gonna ready some more tea, and I'll be right back.
All right, the water's a boiling. Yes, it will be on Discord. I will not be streaming here on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I'll be back at it tomorrow. Um, just no video like being saved anywhere, or the cold reads are just going to be, uh, you know, just these three sessions. All right. Chapter 2 Trouble on the Homestead Part 1 Doris softly closed the bedroom door and turned around to find Kira standing in the hallway, positively racked with worry. <clears throat> All right, let's change up our stuff here. Kill that. This one should be two. No, wait, this one should be three. This one should be two. This one should be one. And I think Fizzy is probably the one we want. How is she doing? The redhead quietly asked. As well as can be expected. I wish I could say she's her mother's daughter. But it's never that easy. I see. It's... Rowana had returned from her trip overseas to find that she had lost her father, the home she grew up in, and a dozen loyal servants that were like family. As one might expect, the woman was absolutely devastated. Knowing it all happened while she was off on a frivolous adventure added a dose of guilt to her grief. Her mother felt much the same, her regret stemming from her inability to save her husband, she was a strong woman in body and spirit, but being the one who survived was its own bitter flavor of tragedy. It was a familiar pain she'd experienced before, shortly before retiring from adventuring. On the bright side, she knew how to cope with it. Doris was still alive to remember the lost, and focusing on that silver lining brought her solace. She trusted Rowana would learn this of she trusted Rowana would learn this lesson eventually, but she needed time. It had barely been a day since her daughter learned the grave news, whereas the mother had a near two-week head start on the grieving process, hence her calm demeanor. Samulus Slythe's passing was also hard on Boxy, mostly because it was now burdened with the untasty job of pretending to be sad and mournful. Such emotions were not only unpleasant, such emotions were not only unpleasant to act out, but also difficult since the amoral creature did not feel a pang of guilt, regret, or remorse. It was annoyed and bothered more than anything. Thankfully, Doris was there to pick up the slack after Kira convinced Rowana at best if she stayed with her mom for a while. Well, technically it was the other way around since the remaining Slythes would be sleeping over at the Morgana residence for the time being.
Thanks for being here for her. Kira twiddled her thumbs awkwardly. I don't... I wish I wasn't... Uh, I just don't know what to do. It's all right, Doris reassuringly grabbed her shoulders. We all mourn in our own ways, and I know you want to be there for her. Just make sure you let it out. It's not healthy to keep those emotions pent up. Oh, Boxy was going to let it out, all right. It was going to let it out so hard that this recent disaster would look like a toddler falling over in a sand pit by comparison. So long as you don't do anything rash, the widow cautioned. What are you talking about? I know what you're planning, Kira. You... you do? You want to track down the one responsible for all this? And? You're not going to try and stop me, are you? No. I wouldn't even think of it. In fact, part of me wants to help you. By the gods, I would like nothing more than to get my hands on that piece of shit and repay the pain he's put my family through hundredfold. Though well past her prime, Doris was still a level ninety-something monk, so this was no empty threat. However, that is not who I am anymore, she shook her head. I am a mother. And my responsibility is to my children first and foremost. Ruana is one thing, but I'm especially fearful for Elias. He idolized his father, and I don't know what he'll do when word reaches him in Velos. The last thing I need right now is for my future daughter-in-law to become so fixated on revenge that she loses sight of what's truly important. Oh, you don't need to worry about that. I don't. This isn't about revenge. Kira said in a low voice. This is punishment. Call it what you want. Just come back to us in one piece. I can handle myself. You uh, can. Jo you can, can you? And what of those three girls you brought with you? Doris naturally had quite a few questions regarding the Nephilim, Unfortunate timing and physical deformities aside, it was quite jarring to learn the redhead had returned with three beautiful blondes in tow. The whole thing just reeked of suspicion, though she wanted to believe Kira had good reasons for dragging those girls around. They're a colleague's relatives. I promise to look after them and teach them a few things as a favor. The Hero of Chaos was both well-connected and a renowned instructor, so her reply made sense. There was clearly a lot more to it, but this was enough for now. That said, she still wasn't too happy with their presence. then perhaps you should send them back, the matriarch suggested. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's a good idea to keep them here with everything that's happened. Couldn't agree more. But my hands are tied. <sighs> They're my responsibility whether I like it or not. At the very least, letting them stew in the surrounding misery and despair would go a long way towards imprinting the cruelties of the real world into those spoiled brats. Pain was an effective teacher, after all, and it needn't always be physical. As for Doris, she clearly didn't like that reply. She closed her eyes for a moment, took a deep breath, and said what she really wanted to say. Hey. I don't want those bimbos strolling around the house like tourists while my daughter is crying herself to sleep. Oh, 
they won't be staying here long. I'm just waiting for some buddies in the FIB to prepare a suitable safe house for them. Really, now? The older woman crossed her arms. You'd trust the imbeciles that repeatedly fail to protect the city from disaster? You know, that's not fair. Nobody could have seen this coming. Even I refused to believe it until I saw it with my own eyes. It's a widow's privilege to be unreasonably bitter. It's about the only one we get. Doris smiled sadly. Still have arrangements to make. Doris stiffly walked off, leaving Kira alone in the hallway. She poked her head into the bedroom to tell Rowana she was heading out, but the elf had indeed cried herself to sleep. The beastkin left a note, donned her adventuring gear, and headed out after reminding the Nephilim sisters to stay put and listen to everything Doris and the Legion guards said. The branch street where the couple had moved was unnaturally quiet and empty despite the afternoon's sunny weather. Normally, there would be a few residents walking around or socializing, perhaps some neighborhood brats looking for trouble, but it was absolutely empty. Kira strode down to the flying public pepcaca block. Kira strode down to the flying public platforms and rode one to the ground level, all in near total silence. What used to be a bustling plaza had transformed into something resembling a slum. Shacks, tents, and other temporary housing dominated the pedestrian roads. Shack, shacks, tents, and other temporary housing dominated the pedestrian roads and pathways as victims left homeless by the disaster milled about, stewing in their misery. Armed guards and people in uniform were everywhere as they did their best to maintain public order and distribute emergency rations and supplies. There was no telling how long this would go on since cleanup crews were still sorting through the mess with no clear sign. There was no telling how long this would go on. There was no telling how long this would go on since cleanup crews were still sorting through the mess with no clear sign of when the reconstruction effort could begin. It was all being carried out on the Republic's bill, of course. Money had never been an issue for the elves' government and they had no reservations about pouring those funds into helping the citizens get back on their feet. <clears throat> the disaster that caused all of this turmoil and unrest had become known as the Great Collapse. It was a terrifyingly apt name as a... It was a terrifyingly apt name, as a single glance towards the crown of the hilt tree to the north of Ambrosia's was enough to reveal what had happened. It seemed surreal, but six of the tree's titanic branches were no longer attached. The city directly underneath those limbs had turned to dust when they fell from their dizzying hundred-meter height. The titanic impact also made the ground quiver and quake, turning everything around the tree's roots to ruin. Civilians, adventurers, and soldiers alike were crushed to death by the meteoric impacts of... Civilians. Civilians, adventurers, and soldiers alike were crushed to death by the meteoric impacts or buried alive in the ensuing rubble. The loss of life was monumental, but far from the only lasting damage inflicted. Numerous administrative and commercial buildings were caught up in the collapse, dealing a serious blow to the Republic's governing ability and econ Numerous, Numerous administrative and commercial buildings were caught up in the collapse, dealing a serious blow to the Republic's governing ability and eco Numerous administrative and commercial buildings were caught up in the collapse, dealing a serious blow to the Republic's governing ability and economic stability. Yet, as tragic as these events were, they had clearly been orchestrated. Those branches had not fallen on their or on their orn. Those those branches had not fallen on their own, nor had they snapped under the weight of the buildings and people that once dwelled on them. Damn it. Those branches had not fallen on their own, nor had they snapped under the weight of the buildings and people that once dwelled on them. A single glance at the stumps made it impossible to deny that they had been cut. 
It seemed ridiculous to think something could slice through hilt branches dozens of meters thick, but there was no other way to explain the stump's smooth surface. These anomalous traces seemed like a good place to start investigating, but Boxy had other venues it wanted to explore first. It had just arrived in Azure Vale via Forest Gate a few hours ago, so it had yet to grasp the full extent of the city's damage. It needed to ask some unpleasant questions and get unbiased answers, so it was currently on its way to meet one of its contacts. After disappearing into the crowd as Kira and... After disappearing into the crowd as Kira and emerging as a generic-looking elf laborer, it made its way due south, the opposite direction of the site of the incident. This part of Azure Vale was known as Dirt Town. It was generally seen as the seedier part of the Republic's capital. It was generally seen as the seedier part of the Republic's capital, especially down here on ground level. Dingy shacks, old tents, and run-down buildings were the norm in Dirt Town, so the collapse hadn't had an... Dingy... Dingy shack... Dingy shacks, old tents, and run-down buildings were the norm in Dirt Town, so the collapse hadn't had a negative impact on the lives of the neighborhoods. Dingy... Dingy shacks, old tents, and run-down buildings were the norm in Dirt Town, so... Dingy shacks, old tents, and run-down buildings were the norm in Dirt Town, so the collapse hadn't had a negative impact on the lives of the neighborhood's residents. Just the opposite, in fact. The streets were filled with people seeking an escape or some sort of outlet after that harrowing event, so local business was on the rise. One establishment in particular could offer multiple forms of relief and was also Boxy's current destination. The Spring Daisy was tucked away in the shadow of a huge hilt root at the heart of Dirt Town. It was a three-story building that instantly stood out as being taller and cleaner than the rest of the neighborhood. Though officially the headquarters of the small and exclusive Sealed Lips Guild, it essentially functioned as a brothel. Such places were entirely legal and could be found elsewhere, but what truly set the Spring Daisy apart was made obvious the instant Boxy stepped inside. Hey, cutie. Fancy busting a nut all over my face? Surely a gentleman like yourself prefers a more sensual, intimate experience? Forget those amateurs. Come with me and I'll show you pleasure unlike any other. A plethora of scantily clad working girls called out to the potential client, which was standard practice for such establishments. Unlike its competition, however, every item on the Spring Daisy's menu was a succubus. Any normal man who walked in here would not leave until both their balls and purse had been drained completely. There was no risk of unwanted pregnancies, no chance of contracting... There was... There was no risk of unwanted pregnancies, no chance of contracting weird diseases, and absolutely zero danger to one's health and general well-being so long as the guild's warlocks kept these temptresses... Fuck. There was no risk of unwanted pregnancies, no chance of contracting... There was no risk of unwanted... Okay, here comes a sneeze. I think... 
<laughs> there was no risk of unwanted pregnancies, no chance of contracting weird diseases, and absolutely zero danger to one's health and general well-being so long as the guild's warlocks kept these temptresses. Fuck! Temptresses. There was no risk of unwanted pregnancies, no chance of contracting weird diseases, and absolutely zero danger to one's health and general well-being so long as the guild's warlocks kept these temptresses on tight leashes. The busty demons were strictly and repeatedly forbidden from hurting the clientele in any way. Unless they asked for it, of course. But even then, it was limited to strictly non-lethal role-playing. And... Role-playing was without a doubt the order of the day at the Spring Daisy. One of the best parts about laying with a succubus, besides the obvious carnal pleasures, was that they were all shapeshifters and gifted impersonators. Whether she was a celebrity, a relative, deceased, or fictional, any woman could become one's partner for an hour. During that time, the succubus would satisfy any wild fantasy or kinky desire with a smile. All things considered, it was not the least bit surprising that the Kira Special was an extremely popular item on the brothel's menu for both male and female patrons. The demons didn't mind this arrangement too much, as they got to enjoy the bodily fluids their kind typically craved on a regular basis. It wasn't ideal, since soul-sucking was a no-no, but it was a far better arrangement than any succubus could realistically hope for. The only thing they had to worry about was competition from each other, hence why they all seemed so overflowingly eager to please the new face that just walked in. Unfortunately for them, Boxy didn't have carnal desires to sate, nor would that be the reason it came here even if it did. The man-shaped creature briskly walked past the eight large-breasted and practically naked women flanking the main hallway and headed straight for the back. This place had no need for bouncers or guards since all of the Merchandise was both expendable and capable of taking care of any violent intruder or would-be robber. The only security measures in place were some sturdy locks. The only security measures in place were some sturdy locks, a bunch of arcane wards, and a green-skinned fiend who was mostly there to keep people from wandering into the members only. The only security... The only security measures in place were some sturdy locks, a bunch of arcane wards, and a green-skinned fiend who was mostly there to keep people from wandering into the members-only parts of the building. Whoa there, bub! He stood in front of the elf-shaped monster. Just where do you think you're going? Just where do you think you're going? To see the manager. To see the manager, Boxy calmly stated. I have a message from her sponsor. I have a message from her sponsor. Oh. All right. Off you go, then. Oh. All right. Oh. All right. Off you go, then. The fiend stood to one side and allowed the shapeshifter to proceed down the hallway behind him until it reached a door at the very end marked. The fiend stood to one side and allowed the shapeshifter to proceed down the hallway behind him until it reached a door at the very end marked management. Inside was a cramped office filled with filing cabinets and shelves, tidy to the point of coming off as lifeless and sterile. The owner, a youthful human woman with black hair and chestnut eyes, raised an eyebrow at her visitor from her seat behind her desk. 
The not an elf's eyes flashed from green to red to blue and then back to green, prompting the other party to flip a switch under her desk. The windowless office's door locked itself with an audible The, win the windowless office's door locked itself with an audible click, and the walls, floor, and ceiling flashed with a dull green light, securing it from prying eyes and ears. Secu securing it from prying eyes and ears. Okay. <clears throat> woman with black hair and chestnut eyes raked her desk. The not an elf's eyes flashed from green to red to blue and then back to green, prompting the other party to flip a switch under her desk. Her desk. The proceed down the hallway behind him until it reached a door at the very end marked management. The windowless Okay, this one I will give to Lucky for sure. What is her name? Honey. That's right. Her name is Honey. I was wondering when you'd show up, Mr. B. The woman smiled and leaned back. You missed one damn loud party. Should have seen the elves scurry about with their heads up their asses. It was quite entertaining. Despite what the authorities were led to believe, not all of the succubi in this den of demons were bound to a mortal. The one currently masquerading as the leader and founder of the Silent Lips. The one, the one currently masquerading as the leader and founder of the Silent Lips Guild certainly wasn't. The one currently masquerading as the leader and founder of the Silent Lips Guild certainly wasn't. Her real name was Honey Nay Nay Fallison Pena 
Panadel Kekske. Panadel Ke- Panadel Kekske. Panadel Kekske. Fallacin. Fallacin. Honey nay nay fallacin. Panadel Kekske. Honey nay nay fall. Honey nay nay fallacin. Panadel. Panadel Kekske. Honey nay nay fallacin. Panadel Kekske. Panadel Kekske. Kekske. Panadel Kekske. Um, the one, okay. Honey nay nay fallacin. Panadel Kekske. Honey nay nay fall. Honey nay nay fallacin. Panadel Kekske. Honey nay nay panadel. No, honey nay nay fallacin. Panadel Kekske. Panadel. Panadel Kekske. Fallacin Panadel Kekske. The one currently masquerading as the leader in. F- Her real name was. Her real name was Honey Nay Nay Fallison Panadel Kaxke, a lily variant of the succubus species infamous for their strong predip- a, li- a lily variant of the succubus species infamous for their strong predisposition towards fondling lady parts. Their special skill allowed them to release an odorless gas to subtly lower mortals' inhibitions in a manner similar to a doppelganger's pheromone control, though not as versatile. This individual was also a pyromancer. This individual was also a pyromancer, though she didn't share a certain gin's mild obsession with burning things to the ground. Yeah, the demon names. Alright, I'm going to go dump this real quick. Get all the oh shit. Get all the tea leaves out of here. All right. Uh, session with burning things to the ground. <clears throat> Boxy first came into contact with Honey when the latter reached out to the former through Demons R Us with a proposition. She could provide the shapeshifter a steady stream of both funds and information, and all it had to do in exchange was help her eliminate and replace her surprisingly prudish mistress, the Spring Daisy's owner. It was a low-risk, low-reward endeavor that Boxy ended up agreeing to. Silently removing and replacing the original was simple enough, though it still had to be around whenever mandatory appraisals in... Silent... Silently removing and replacing the original was simple enough, though it still had to be around whenever mandatory appraisal inspections rolled around every three months or so. At that time, the monster would use its essence concealment and some social engineering to convince the government official that the Sealed Lips Guildmaster was alive and well. The investment had paid out quite well considering how little effort was required. A regular cut of the profits was nice, even if the amount was nothing compared to the rest of its hoard. Boxy liked to think of it as boxing tax, which it levied on quite a few of its contacts as a form of mild amusement. 
The truly valuable part of this agreement was the information gathered here. <clears throat> the truly valuable the truly valuable part of this agreement was the information gathered here. Though situated in a seedy neighborhood, the Spring Daisy was a premium establishment that attracted customers with much higher standards and more refined tastes than other brothels. They even offered deliveries for especially generous patrons that wanted some extra discretion regarding their evening entertainment. Either way, it was almost ridiculous how loose-lipped the members of Azure Vale's upper class grew once a succubus had her legs around them. Blackmail had the... Either, either way, it was almost ridiculous how loose-lipped the members of Azure Vale's upper class grew once a succubus had her legs around them. Blackmail had been the Spring Daisy's secret weapon for years. and its new owner was more than happy to keep the tradition alive. However, Boxy wasn't here to take part in the dirty secret trade. Blackmail had been the Spring Daisy's secret weapon for years, and its new owner was more th However, Boxy wasn't here to take part in the dirty secret trade. The Collapse! I need you to tell me what you know about it! Hmm. Straight to business, as usual, huh? Honey smirked. Well, I can't say I hate that part of you. Well, I can't say I hate that part of you. Though she was a succubus, sucking the life out of mortals through their groins wasn't what she had in mind when she sought out Boxy's assistance. She thought of herself as a purist, a succubus so in tune with the race's conniving, deceitful, fraudulent nature that she valued conspiracy over coitus. Honey, along with dozens more like-minded temptresses, had formed a Kira Appreciation Club within the beyond. They did not... They did so not out of a desire to boink the bronze-skinned redhead, though they wouldn't pass up the chance if it was offered, but out of admiration for the mind-bogglingly web of... But, but out of admiration for the mind-boggling web of lies surrounding the Hero of Chaos, watching that holier-than-thou bitch's kids get sucked into the vortex of falsehoods called Kira Morgana had become the club's new favorite pastime. Honey couldn't see it for herself, unfortunately, as the progenitor's broadcasts were unavailable to those in the material realm. Her fellow Kira fans were more than happy to keep her up to date whenever she called them, so she was fully aware of the shapeshifter's current situation. They also kept her abreast of other developments they'd caught wind of, adding to her repertoire as Boxy's main information broker. It was a position that Honey was quite proud of, as it allowed her to take a prominent part in one of the biggest conspiracies in centuries. The work she did was far more satisfying than any amount of carpet munching could ever be. Damn it. Do you want the long or short version? She asked matter-of-factly. Do you want the long or short version? version? Keep it brief. Keep it brief. All right. To start, 
your friends in the Foundation were most likely the attack's primary target. The Foundation had bases in those tree branches? Oops, shit. Crashed my Ableton. I gotta wait for it to load. Load, fucker. Oh, sorry. I broke my presentation. Those tree branches? It... no, but the collapse... collapse took out a whole lot of important people with considerable wealth and influence. The kind of old money types that would have no qualms financial un financing unethical and heretical research for the sake of their precious republic. The woman passed Boxy a list of a hundred or so names presumably casualties of importance caught up in the attack. It recognized several of them as ones it had strongly suspected of being in league with the Foundation, so the demon's first assessment was not entirely without merit. It would also explain why the targeted area was of so little political and strategic importance. Sure, some administrative... Sure, some administrative... Sure, some administ... Sure, some administrative buildings were wrecked, Sure, some administrative buildings were wrecked, but they were mostly empty since the collapse happened. Sure, some administrative buildings were wrecked, but they were mostly empty since the collapse happened in the middle of the night. If this was an attack on the government, then it was either poorly timed or completely missed its mark. Anybody who'd make such basic mistakes wouldn't have been able to pull off something this big. Unless, of course... Their actual target was a shadowy organization that may or may not have been the real power behind the scenes. What about the Slythes? Boxy asked its informant. Were they part of the Foundation as well? Were they part of the Foundation as well? No, Whisper Room. I am in my... my new full narration room. Don't you judge me.
It was unsurprising and a little bit worrisome that Rowana's father was on that list. Boxy doubted they were involved, but had no evidence one way or the other. There's no way to know for sure, Honey shook her head. In fact, all of this is mostly speculation based on circumstances. Those people keep a tight lid on their operations, as you well know. However, Mrs. Slythe's survival leads me to believe they were nothing more than collateral. <clears throat> mm. Now that you mention it. Boxy looked back to the list of casualties. Some of the names were marked with a red cross, and the shapeshifter recognized all of them as individuals with actual power, not just monetary or political. They were either retired or active adventurers, including a few rankers, and all of them were powerful enough to survive or at least challenge the upcoming Dragon Festival. It was ludicrous to think these people were killed by something as simple as gravity, even if the scale of the fall was rather extraordinary. These seven you've marked. They didn't die in the collapse, did they? Indeed, the succubus confirmed Boxy's suspicions. Though the FIB hasn't made the news public, they've determined those victims were assassinated, stabbed to death either in their sleep or after the hundred-meter fall had softened them up. They didn't die in the collapse, did they? They didn't die in the collapse, did they? Indeed, the succubus. How do you know all this if they're keeping it hush-hush? Information was only as good as its source, after all. Their investigations used quite a few beholders to help look for survivors and analyze evidence. I just had some of my girls arrange an exchange with one of the melon heads while they were off duty. Hmm. I see. Do they have any leads on how the collapse happened? Judging from what Boxy had gathered so far, those six branches had fallen off at exactly the same time almost as if the tree had grown bored and cast them off. That clearly wasn't the case, as no dryad... That... that clearly wasn't the case, as no dryad would willingly sacrifice her limbs, especially if it would result in the deaths of thousands of the elves favored by their mother, Nairi. It was also ludicrous to think anyone was capable of forcing or coercing one of those... Tr it was all... It was also ludicrous to think anyone was capable of forcing or coercing one of those tree spirits to do so, though some amount of deception and misdirection had likely taken place. No idea there. Sorry, Mr. B. You probably know more about it than I do. Hmm. Unfortunate. Boxy didn't expect its search for payback would be that easy. Boxy didn't expect its search for payback would be that easy, but it was still disappointed it didn't But it was But it was still disappointed it didn't get a lot of answers. Still, this was only the first of its sources, and the revelation that the Foundation's upper echelons were the main target was as good a lead as it was going to get. So have I earned myself a finder's fee? Honey coyly asked. Mm. I suppose you have. I suppose you have. I suppose you have. The succubus excitedly clapped her hands and stood from her seat while reverting to her base form. She cast off her robe and her skin turned a deep crimson with patches of dark, freckle-like scales. 
Her eyes were now as red as the rest of her, and her hair had turned a rich brown hue tied off in a braided ponytail. A pair of thin, narrow horns jutted out of the sides of her head, and a serpentine tail dangled from her lower back. She clearly had a bit of raptor influence, which was most probably why her true form was practically as flat as a board compared to the rest of her voluptuous sisters. Meanwhile, Boxy had already changed its outward appearance from an elven laborer to a fully nude and provocatively smiling Kira that caused Honey to purr in anticipation. While carnal pursuits were not at the top, while carnal pursuits were not at the top of this particular succubus's list of priorities, they were still there. As good as the brothel girls were at imitating the public persona of the Hero of Chaos, none could compare to the genuine article. Or, well, as genuine an article could get, considering it was all a big lie. Though knowing that only served to turn Honey on even more. After essentially whoring itself out, Boxy decided to try contacting the Foundation directly. In order to do that, it had to drop by its home dungeon and fetch the Calm Crystal to... In order to... In order to do that... In order to do that, it had to drop by its home dungeon and fetch the Calm Crystal to get in touch with Silas Underwood, its main point of contact with the clandestine group. Its main its main point of contact with the clandestine group. It had left it there so that Lavender could inform it remotely in case it rang while it was away. Incidentally, the Alronad Dungeon Master was blissfully unaware that anything of importance had happened on the outside. According to her testimony, she didn't even feel the earth-cracking tremors caused by uncountable tons of timber falling on a neighboring part of the city. Then again, none of Kira and Rowana's neighbors had felt them either. They just reported hearing the thunderous crash and seeing the massive dust cloud. It would appear that nothing short of a truly calamitous quake would shake Ambrosia's tree enough for it to rattle Boxy's dungeon. Upon returning to its lair, however, the shapeshifter realized exactly why the Foundation had been silent despite the collapse. Though the calm crystal in its po Though the calm Though the calm crystal in its possession remained intact, its soft blue glow had been replaced with a lifeless gray hue. Though the, though the calm crystal in its possession remained intact, its soft blue glow had been replaced with a lifeless gray hue. This meant that the item's twin had been shattered, rendering this particular object almost completely worthless. The hilt creeper had several other ways to get in touch with the organization, but there was no telling how many were available. This was inconvenient, to say the least. Time wasn't on its side. It was almost two weeks late to the party, so it had to act fast to try and pick up the perpetrator's trail before it ran dead cold. Its urgency was partly caused by its monstrous nature, which demanded revenge for having several of its plans and plots ruined out of nowhere, but that was far from the only reason. It wanted to learn what sort of power could cut off six hilt branches at once. Such knowledge would have quite a few practical applications. Even if the shapeshifter couldn't use it, it would, at the very least, be able to take per Even if... Even if the shapeshifter couldn't use it, it would, at the very least, be able to take precautions against it, or maybe trade it for other, equally terrible secrets. Tragedy and opportunity went hand in hand, and Boxy T. Morningwood had never hesitated to take advantage of both. Rather than trying to get in touch with Foundation survivors, the shapeshifter decided to take initiative and investigate the collapse itself. It had the option of doing so publicly as Kira, acting alongside the Republic government. Doing so had obvious benefits, such as considerable support and an always welcome boost to its alter ego's image. However, it would also have to share whatever the big secret was. Alternatively, it could go the private route, though it had no idea where to start other than checking in with the pruned hilt tree's dryad and getting her side of the story. Doing so would be tricky since Boxy hadn't introduced itself to any of Ambrosia's sisters, and their ilk didn't have a habit of answering when random mortals came knocking on their bark. 
Thankfully, the shapeshifter had a very loud doorbell, an enchanted orb of amber known as the Elder Dryad's Authority. It had never failed to grant it an audience with a hilt tree's spirit thus far and would likely succeed this time as well. However, there was a very real chance Boxy would attract not just the Elder Dryad's attention, but also her ire. The monster imagined that, having just been vandalized on such a colossal scale, Ambrosia's sibling would be in profoundly... However... However, there was a very real chance Boxy would attract not just the Elder Dryad's attention, but also her ire. The monster imagined that, having just been vandalized on such a colossal scale, Ambrosia's sibling would be in a profoundly foul mood for a long, long while. The creature pondered its next step for a while longer until real. The creature pondered its next step for a while longer until it realized neither of those approaches were mutually exclusive, so it decided to pursue both. It pocketed the Elder Dryad's authority from one of its treasuries and prepared to set out as Kira. It would have to visit the Cat Girl's guild office at the Central Consortium and put an e it, would it would have to visit the Cat Girl's guild office at the Central Consortium and put in an official request. It would have to visit the Cat Girl's It would have to visit the Cat Girl's guild office at the Central Consortium and put in an official request with her guildmaster. While it could go directly to the FIB, protocols and procedures existed to keep order in such turbulent times, and blatantly disrespecting them was not the sign of an honest person. Wait a minute. The shapeshifter paused as realization hit. Aren't I approaching this from the wrong direction? Rather than what, how, or when, Boxy should have started with who? The Foundation was a secret society with plenty of questionable dealings, so it was not surprising they'd have enemies. The mastermind behind the collapse had clearly been out for blood, otherwise they wouldn't have employed such a brutal method of attack. Yet, the way they handled things still held a certain finesse and meticulousness, not to mention it must have taken a good deal of resources, planning, and organization. Boxy spent the next half hour pacing around its dungeon while piecing things together, and there was only one individual it could think of that would have plenty of those, not to mention ample motive. Reggie, it growled. I should have known! This sort of scenario was a brilliant demonstration of how it imagined the Ganger Capo did things. This sort of scenario was a brilliant demonstration of how it managed. Hey, Rob Laflamme. Laflamme? How do I pronounce your last name? Laflamme? Uh, he says, Hi, Jeff. My haunted speak and say sends its regards. Well, I'm so glad. Uh, uh, Rob showed up to, uh, Davenport, Iowa, Planet Funk Con I was at, and, uh, he had me, he had me sign his speak and spell. Speak and say. So, that's cool. Haven't signed a pair of tits yet. I, I just now realized that. Hmm. I wonder if that's ever going to happen. We'll see. This sort of scenario. This sort of scenario was a brilliant demonstration of... This sort of scenario was a brilliant demonstration of how it imagined the Ganger Capo did things. Yes, it was flashy and attention-grabbing, 
but it was brutally effective and impossible to cover up. After all, if the Gilded Hand's fall taught Boxy anything, it was that a shadowy organization was done for the instant it was dragged into the light. It was also likely Reggie would not have made such a huge move unless he had taken every step imaginable to ensure its success. The attack's timing was doubtlessly one such precaution. While the collapse's date was of no particular significance, it had happened while the Hero of Chaos was still out in the middle of the shimmering ocean. It was the perfect time for someone to stir up trouble without fear of immediate retribution from Boxy or Kira, as it would have... as it as it would have been at least a week before the shapeshifter would have... It was the... It was the perfect time for someone to stir up trouble without fear of immediate retribution from Boxy or Kira, as it would have been at least a week before the shapeshifter would have had... would have a chance. Oh shit, what time is it? Oh, it's only 3.08, oh, okay. It was the perfect time... It was the... where to go? It was the perfect time for someone to stir up trouble without fear of immediate retribution from Boxy or Kira, as it would have been at least a week... Oh my god, why is that so hard to say? It was the perfect time for someone to stir up trouble without fear of immediate retribution from Boxy or Kira, as it would have been at least a week before the shapeshifter would have a chance to find out. It had actually taken even longer since the monster had been distracted by Teresa's spawn, giving Reggie at least a twelve-day head start in covering his tracks. Which, considering he had decades of experience leading the country's biggest crime syndicate, meant Boxy's odds of tracking him down now were... meant... meant Boxy's odds of tracking him down now were effectively nil. Hello, everybody. The population has has resurged. I have a couple more pages and then I'm done for today. But thanks, everybody, for having come come in to hang out with me while I narrated Everybody Loves Large Chests, Volume 10. I'm just going to go ahead and end the stream right after I'm done finishing this chapter out. Um, but um, thanks again. Really appreciate all of your support, everybody. Um, don't forget we have two different Neven Ilyev titles that are exclusive to soundbooththeater.com that have cinematic that are cinematic audio excuse me <clears throat> one is scaffed or small chests are fine too which is a spin-off of everybody loves large chests in which uh fizzy is the main character and dory Sachs. if those of you are, who are here are behind on listening to the audiobooks uh dory Sachs has replaced me as fizzy and she also narrated the entire Small Chests Are Fine 2 um, audiobook and cinematic audio series. And she does, does a fantastic job. I think that Fizzy sounds better than she ever has. So um, go check those out if you haven't already. First episode of the cinematic version is free. Also, Neven Ilyev's The Stars Have Eyes, which is a complete 180 from Everybody Loves Large Chests. Um, it is a romantic comedy. Basically, the concept is, what if Cthulhu was your girlfriend? And uh, it's actually, instead of being sociopathic and violent and fucked up, The Stars Have Eyes is actually very heartwarming and human and um, just wholesome. A really great story, really fun. I cried at the end. Lots of great music. Um, and yeah, that's it, it's a great series. Uh, also, there's the Dungeon Crawler Carl Audio Immersion Tunnel. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we rebooted the series of Dungeon Crawler Carl in what would be called cinematic audio if we were allowed to legally call it that. Instead, it's called the Audio Immersion Tunnel. First episode is free. The rest of the season is available available, available for pre-order and uh, 
episode two releases on, on October 31st. The rest of the episodes will be releasing every two weeks until the first season is completely done. And if we do well enough with that series, uh, we will start a season two next year. And season two will encompass books two and three of Dungeon Crawler Carl. So, um, yeah, guys, thanks so much for, for coming once again. Check the description below for all the links that you might want. Um, look for the newest Sound Booth Theater releases on Audible as well, including Dungeon in the Clouds, uh, Prophecy Approved Companion 2, and if you haven't listened to that one, of course, one is still available out there. And uh, we have the pre-order for Shadow Agency up, which is basically a lit RPG red wall by M.A. Carlson, narrated by Zachary Johnson, and backed up by myself and Emma Kate Starling. All right, guys. Thanks again. This is the last cold read for Everybody Lar Loves Everybody Loves Large Chests, Volume 10. If you want to keep listening to me narrate it live, join our Discord. I'll be back at it tomorrow, possibly over the weekend, and uh, at the very least the first three uh, days of next week. All right, here goes the last of this chapter. The shapeshifter wasn't about to give up that easily. Even if it was just to preserve its main facade, it still wanted to investigate. The shapeshifter wasn't about to give up that easily. Even if it was just to preserve its main facade, it still wanted to investigate this great collapse as soon as possible. With that in mind, it got into character and made a beeline for the guild offices. Once at the Central Consortium, it found the place bustling with activity as adventurers of all professions were doing what they could to help. The Exarch's office had posted a number of emergency quests that caught Boxy's attention. The monster had been slightly curious as to how exactly the Republic planned to move those titanic branches, or whether they wanted to at all. According to the notices plastered all over the place, they intended to recycle them into timber that would supply the eventual rebuilding efforts. It was a bold move, considering some people likely had reservations about living in a house made from the stuff that destroyed so many lives. That aside... It was quite the undertaking. The iron bark on those detached limbs was anywhere between one and two meters thick and would require a small army of miners to strip it away before the carvers and laborers could start processing the lumber underneath. Looking at the various quests, Boxy had an epiphany. Looking at the various quests, Boxy had an epiphany and decided to check on something before visiting the Hidden Arrows Guild Master. Fuck. Looking at the various quests, Boxy had an epiphany and decided to check on something before visiting the Hidden Arrows Guild Master. It looked around for a free receptionist and was able to find one despite the high traffic, mostly because the consortium was in all-hands-on-deck mode. Damn. Mostly because the... Mostly because the consortium was in all-hands-on-deck mode. When Kira approached the counter, she instantly demanded access to all of the personal quests, letters, messages, and other packages that had arrived for her while she was away. This request seemed rather odd to the receptionist, since now... This request seemed rather odd to the receptionist, since now was hardly the time to be checking on fan mail, but he complied all the same. He excused himself and disappeared for a few minutes before coming back with a large wooden box bearing Kira's name. The cat girl gratefully accepted it and carried it off to a secluded spot in the Hidden Arrows member-only area. Fuck! The cat girl gratefully... The cat girl gratefully accepted it and... The cat girl gratefully accepted it and carried it off to a secluded spot in the Hidden Arrows member-only area. She retrieved a set of speed-reading spectacles from her waist mount- waist mounted. Fuck. She ret- She retrieved a- uh, bleh bleh. She retrieved a set of speed-reading sp She retrieved a set of speed-reading spectacles from her waist mounted ethereal. She retrieved a set of speed-reading spectacles from her waist-mounted ethereal repository and began leafing through the hundreds of envelopes and missives addressed to her. Boxy decided to check these because it remembered the circumstances under- Fuck, man! Can't get through two sentences. Boxy decided to check these because it remembered the circumstances under which it last saw Reggie two years ago. 
It had liberated the elder ganger from the Foundation's brainwashing by using Ambrosia's absurdly potent waters of life. The former banker disappeared without a trace afterwards, but not before coming to something of an agreement with the Hero of Chaos. The older shapeshifter had worn to look in... had sworn. The old... The older shapeshifter had sworn to look into ways of dismantling the organization that used him and, to an extent, helped create him. The older shapeshifter had sworn to look into ways of dismantling the organization that used him and, to an extent, helped create him. It was a goal that Boxy had, at the time, expressed willingness to assist with. Reggie was supposed to reach out to his much younger accomplice by sending its facade a personal request with a very specific name and subject matter. Sure enough, just as Boxy had guessed, the promised message was waiting for it in a standardized personal quest form. It had been submitted two days before the collapse happened and requested that Kira escort and protect someone named G.O. Wells as he transported a shipment of frozen peas to Bitterhold. The alias and cargo identified Reggie as the sender, but that destination was definitely not part of the code they had agreed on. It would appear that it was time to pay the good Warden Stain another visit. All right, guys, and that is it. Thank you so much. Last time, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with me while I do uh, my cold reads of Everybody Loves Large Chests, Volume 10. Uh, come hang in the Discord tomorrow if you want to hear more, and I hope you all have a good rest of your night. Bye-bye.